the voyage of discovery that's opening up in front of the members of the sixth resident crew on the International Space Station is a journey that each of them has been getting ready for since he was a little boy. For Navy Captain Ken Bowersox, a native of Portsmouth, Virginia, the dream of becoming an astronaut was sparked in the southern Indiana town of Bedford in Lawrence County, which proudly claims the most astronauts per capita of any place in America. When I was about seven years old, I was driving around in a car with my father, um, listening to the radio, and uh, on the radio was a broadcast uh, describing John Glenn orbiting the Earth. Uh, and I talked to my father about that. That sounded like a pretty neat thing to do. And uh, back then, I decided that maybe someday to be uh, need to be an astronaut. Bowersox earned a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering at the U.S. Naval Academy and made more than 300 carrier landings as a pilot while assigned to the USS Enterprise. After completing Air Force Test Pilot School, he spent a year and a half flying at the Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division Test Center in China Lake, California, before being selected as an astronaut in 1987, for which he credits his parents and their steady encouragement. There are probably a lot of people that could have said, well, gosh, do you know how many people apply to be astronauts and how few get selected? Why don't you lower your sights a little bit to something more realistic? They never said that. They said, well, give it a shot. Maybe you'll get it. Um, I think they were a little surprised <laughs> when I got selected, like I was. Um, but um, they were a tremendous encouragement. Bowersox first flew in space in 1992 as the pilot on a two-week science mission and again as pilot in 1993 on the first Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission. He commanded the second flight of the U.S. Microgravity Science Laboratory in 1995, and in 1997, he commanded the second Hubble servicing flight. Bowersox also trained as the backup to Expedition 1 commander Bill Shepard before starting preparations to command Expedition 6. The lone Russian member on this crew is flight engineer Nikolai Budarin, a veteran of two long-duration flights to the Mir space station that were both part of the first phase of the ISS program. He was born and grew up in the town of Kyria in Chuvasha, located about 300 miles east of Moscow, and was eight years old the day Yuri Gagarin made history. But I remember it was sunny, nice weather outside. We were uh, trying to uh, see the spot in, in the skies, but we boys and girls were still out there peering into the sky. He has, of course, long landed since, but we were still looking. It was a turning point in uh, not in only my life, but in the lives of all other boys and girls. And that was when the dream was born for me. With a degree in mechanical engineering from the Moscow Aviation Institute, Budarin began work at the Rocket Space Corporation Energia. After 10 years as an engineer, he was selected as a cosmonaut and began training for a mission to the Mir space station. Training that brought him to Houston because he and Mir-19 commander Anatoly Soloviev reached Mir on board the first shuttle to dock to the Russian station in June 1995. And from the vantage point of their Soyuz spacecraft, they captured this unique view of the shuttle and the Russian station when Atlantis undocked. On his second space flight, Budarin and Mir-25 commander Talgut Musabayev spent more than four months of their 207-day-long mission with astronaut Andy Thomas, the last American to live on Mir. Budarin believes today's international space effort is a natural result of what began 40 years ago. Of course, we were filled with, with a sense of pride for our country because our, our fellow countryman, Yuri Gagarin, uh, was the first man into space. But of course, it is the, uh, an achievement for the uh, mankind as a whole. And now we're continuing his, in his footsteps. The NASA ISS science officer on this crew is Dr. Don Pettit, who was born and raised in the small northwest Oregon town of Silverton, outside Salem. Pettit says he was always a curious kid, but not always focused on flying in space. I went to undergraduate school at Oregon State University in chemical engineering. And from there I went to University of Arizona to do my graduate work. Not with becoming an astronaut in mind, but because these were fields that I wanted to study. 
And then it wasn't until I was graduating from graduate school that I thought of putting an application into the program and uh, applying to be an astronaut. With a doctorate in chemical engineering from Arizona, Pettit went to work at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. He worked on a range of projects, including the redesign of Space Station Freedom, before being selected as an astronaut in 1996. Pettit had trained as a backup for this mission for a year and a half when a medical issue with a colleague prompted his move to the Prime crew only a few months before launch. I consider myself an explorer, and you can explore in many different ways, whether it's under the stage of a microscope or, or running off in a laboratory and making other measurements. Uh, I've been an explorer for as long as I can remember. Exploring space is just one aspect of that. It's something that I've been interested in since I was a little kid, and uh, uh, now I'm doing it. Pettit's making his first space flight with two crewmates who started this mission with more than 333 days experience on orbit over six previous space flights. Well, from the SDS 113 crew, uh, we're happy to be here, and uh, the weather was superb. It was just flat and awesome. We do want to thank the folks down here at the Cape that processed the vehicle uh, and turn it around and get it ready for launch. We understand things are going very well, and the payload is ready to go, and we're looking forward to continuing construction of our great ship on the high seas and helping Expedition 6 set sail and uh, bringing Expedition 5 back to port. Then with that, I'll turn it over to Lieutenant Colonel Paul Lockhart from Amarillo, Texas. Thanks, Jim. It's a real pleasure to be standing right here again, as I was a few months ago, and it's going to be a great honor to bring back Expedition 5 and to shake their hands and say uh, welcome back. And I look forward to uh, the, the great opportunity to take up my comrades, especially uh, the ones from my uh, astronaut class, uh, Expedition 6, and uh, to uh, once again be part of uh, our historic uh, opportunity to build uh, the most premier space station on orbit right now. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I did some quick math in the cockpit on the way here, and I figured that about 600 people have come to this microphone before me, and so if you're expecting me to come up with a novel and original way to say I'm happy to be here, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, that said, while the great people here have been working on the orbiter, the engines, the boosters, and the tank, we've been uh, doing our best to try to keep up getting ready for uh, the flight with our training team and our flight control teams. But we can't do the spacewalks until we uh, make the trust, and we can't make the trust until we do a good rendezvous and a dock. We can't do that until we launch. And all that starts here in about 10 hours when we pick up the count. So we're all looking forward to it. I'd like to pass it off to uh, my spacewalking buddy, John Harrington from Wetumpka, Oklahoma. Thanks, Ellie. No, it's uh, always tell people I'm really happy to be here. The chance I uh, had to work at the Cape for two and a half years as a uh, Cape Crusader was one of the most uh, fabulous times I've had in my career. Now I get to be on the other side of the hatch, so this is going to be even more exciting. Now, the folks down here uh, are very enthusiastic about what they do, and they do a great job, and I look forward to being able to climb on board a, a super ship uh, to go into orbit. Uh, I've got a great crew, uh, a bunch of fabulous guys that love what they do and are real enthusiastic about it, so I'm looking forward to flying and, uh, and uh, getting off the uh, Earth here on Monday. It is so great to be back in Florida getting ready for another launch. Uh, my last trip here uh, in preparation for a space shuttle mission was over five years ago. 
uh, during that time, the NASA team has accomplished some really amazing feats on orbit as we build the International Space Station. Uh, I have confidence that that trend is going to continue during Expedition 6 and that uh, more and more great things are ahead of all of us, uh, the American public, our international partners, and all the wonderful people at NASA that make this work possible. Uh, now I'd like to turn the mic over to Nikolai Budarin, uh, our Soyuz Commander and Flight Engineer 1 for Expedition 6. Good evening. I'm very glad to, to be here today with our crew. In uh, three days, we, we will start uh, to walk in space, and I hope uh, our work will be successful. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to moving into my new home. I've already paid the first month's rent and the last month's rent, and I'm a little worried that I'm not going to be able to pay the rent when I'm up there, but I'm told it'll take them a couple of months before they get around to evict you, so that'll turn out just fine. And I, I really do appreciate all the work that the folks here have done to, to get our orbiter ready and to get the station ready, and uh, it's uh, uh, going to be an experience of a lifetime. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to our STS 113 countdown status briefing on uh, this uh, L minus three day. Uh, we have with us today for our briefing Steve Altimus, Shuttle Test Director, Scott Higginbotham, the STS-113 Payload Mission Manager, Good morning. and Kathy Winters, our Shuttle Weather Officer. Good morning. And we'll begin our briefing today with a statement from each of these, starting with Steve. Thank you, Bruce. Oh, good morning, and welcome to the 113 Launch Countdown Status Briefing. Let me start off by saying that this vehicle has been an exceptionally clean vehicle from its roll into the OPF through its 130-day processing flow out to the launch pad. Um, and we are working no technical issues out of the launch pad at this time. All our standard processing activities leading up to countdown uh, have been completed, and we did pick up the count this morning as planned, and we're currently tracking along the countdown timeline with no technical issues. As far as the countdown timeline goes, um, the first two shifts of work are essentially to check out our avionics systems and prep uh, the vehicle for our cryoreactant loading. That cryoreactant loading will begin uh, late tonight and continue into the morning hours on Saturday. Uh, Saturday's activities will mainly be focused around our final engine preparations and also powering on the orbiter and ground uh, communication systems, voice and data networks. Uh, we plan to early Sunday morning uh, remove or rotate the service structure uh, back away from the vehicle and prep for uh, ET cryogenic loading. Uh, Sunday afternoon, We'll load the uh, external tank and begin our final sequence of events to strap in the flight crew and count down in the terminal count sequence to a launch. Our uh, launch period for Monday um, is set for uh, just after midnight on Monday night uh, through 0400 on Monday morning. Landing is 11 day mission and uh, with one extension day and we're planning on uh, landing Thursday evening, uh, November 21st. For scrub turnaround plans, it's our standard support of, uh, we have 24 hour and 48 hour turnaround capabilities available to us. Uh, we'll try two, two consecutive attempts, stand down for a day, um, and then try two additional attempts. Uh, we do have uh, four days of LH2 PRSD hold time and about nine days of LOX PRSD hold time, which really don't enter into those scrub plans. Uh, we're, we're well within margin there. Uh, we are sharing the range with a Delta IV, which occurs uh, after our uh, uh, four launch attempts in five days, and then later after the Delta will be the Atlas launch. And so in summary, uh, again, the vehicle is in exceptional shape. Uh, again, we're not working any technical issues. The team is geared up and focused on uh, launch countdown and prep for a uh, Monday morning launch. Okay. okay. Thanks, Steve. And now Scott Higginbotham with an update on the payloads. 
Uh, thank you, Bruce, and good morning, everyone. Our primary payload, the P1 truss element, arrived here at KSC in July of 2000. And in the months and years that followed, we performed an extensive round of tests, assembly, and closeout operations. That work was concluded in mid-October when we installed P1 into the orbiter on the 15th. We then performed our final closeouts on the 17th, and we closed the payload bay doors for flight on the 18th. P1 is a passive element for launch. It will remain passive all the way through ascent, and as such, it is currently in a launch-ready configuration, and there's no further activities for our primary payload. Our secondary payload, the MIMS-based TICA satellite inspector, or MEPSI, arrived at KSC on the 7th of October of this year. It underwent about seven days of offline preparations, and then it was delivered to the pad on the 14th of October, installed into the orbiter, tested, and closed out on that very same day. Like P1, it is passive for ascent, and it's currently in a launch-ready configuration. Our only countdown activity in front of us is our late ISS utilization mid-deck experiment stow. That's scheduled to occur right now, early morning on Sunday. During that uh, activity, we will be installing one powered and a couple of uh, passive items. The powered experiment is the protein crystal growth single locker thermal enclosure system, or PCGS test. This experiment has flown with us many times in the past, and it's an investigation that looks at the growth of protein crystals and microgravity. We're also carrying up some passive samples for the zeolite crystal growth experiment, which is currently underway on the station, and these samples are passive. We're also installing some samples that are going to be performed as part of an, an experiment called InSpace in the microgravity science glove box facility on the U.S. lab. And uh, this is also a materials processing type experiment. Upon the conclusion of our installation activities on Sunday morning, the entire 11A payload launch package will be ready for flight. A brief word about scrub turnaround for our primary and secondary elements, P1 and MAPSI, we have no requirements whatsoever. They're quite content to sit in the bay until the vehicle leaves the ground, whenever that may be. And for our uh, mid-deck experiments, the most restrictive ones are the ZCG and the PCGS tests. Uh, if we install them as planned on Sunday morning, they will be good for launch attempts on both Monday and Tuesday before we will need to go in and refurbish them. In summary, at this point, we're not working any issues or concerns, and our entire team is, is looking forward to seeing our flight hardware put in space where it belongs so that we can continue with the construction of the International Space Station. Bruce? Thanks, Scott. And next we have Kathy Winters, who will provide a forecast for our launch weather. Thank you. Uh, the weather during the countdown is looking very good. We have high pressure dominating the area, and so weather is good uh, for the next couple of days here at KSC. Um, but uh, then as we get closer to launch, the weather still does look good. We do start getting a little bit more moisture coming into the atmosphere at that time. So we are expecting some isolated showers to be in the area, but uh, not uh, a big concern for launch. If we do happen to delay that, though, we are expecting uh, to start being a little bit more concerned about the weather as a frontal boundary approaches from the west. So looking at the satellite picture, the uh, weather is looking very good uh, here today, as you can see. And again, uh, no concerns for the next couple of days. And as we get into tanking on Sunday, uh, weather is looking good. There's just a slight chance of those isolated showers with only a 5% chance of weather prohibiting tanking. For our launch forecast, we are looking at scattered skies uh, and just a slight chance again of those isolated showers with a 20% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. For the SRB recovery, the weather is looking good at the time of launch, looking for scattered skies. Again, just some isolated showers expected. And uh, just for the next few days, if there are any delays, the conditions would degrade out there with some seas picking up uh, six to seven feet if there was a 24-hour delay. And then going into the Kona site, uh, the Kona site say do, do look good for the first day of launch. And for the Cal sites, just mainly a concern about some showers at Zaragoza and the weather at Verona is uh, looking good. And if we delay 24 hours, we are still looking for just scattered skies, but we do get more concerned about those showers in the area with the moisture increasing in the atmosphere at that time. So we are looking at a 30% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. And the Kona sites are looking very good. And for the Tal sites, we are concerned at both sites for showers within 20 nautical miles. And if we do delay 
48 hours. Uh, this is when the frontal boundary from the west would be approaching our area. So we do get concerned about the cloud layers in the area, as well as showers and isolated thunderstorms. And there's also a crosswind concern on this day. So with that, we do have a 60% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch if we do slip 48 hours. But the Kona sites uh, remain good for all three days. And the Tau sites uh, still is concerned for showers within 20 nautical, mile at both, nautical miles at both of the Tau sites. And that concludes my briefing. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Let's open it up for questions. Um, starting with Marcia. Um, Marcia, then Associated Press for Steve. It seems like you've had two um, compounds so close together. I'm just wondering how's the pace been? Has it uh, been sort of hectic, or um, how's that all going? Well, actually, um, you know, by the by the you can tell by the the condition of the vehicle that this vehicle is ready to go fly. Our team likes it when we're launching on a regular basis. Um, so this, this has been an exciting time for our team, you know, to put a couple launches up back to back with uh, essentially 30 days or so separation. So we really like this pace. Our team thrives on it, and uh, the vehicle's uh, behaving, and we're ready to go for uh, Sunday morning. Uh, thanks. And for Scott, um, have you had any um, last-minute requests for um, stowage from the Russians or from even the Americans for space station, things that you might want to take up at the last minute? Yes, we have. Uh, not from the Russians, but on the U.S. side, there have been some problems noted with the carbon dioxide removal system on board the U.S. lab, and we are carrying that to valves that can be used as part of the troubleshooting process. Those valves were uh, removed from a, an E-plus rack that was going to support Node 3 ultimately. They were shipped down from Huntsville last night. They are uh, currently being packaged in the locker to take out and stow onto the orbiter, so everything's ready to go there. Are these like small little things or these are big valves or do you have any idea of size? I have no idea how oh. big they are. I haven't seen them myself. And, and, and are any extra lithium hydroxide canisters being taken up to supplement the system as far as you know? I don't know about that either. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, Mark Caro from the Houston Chronicle. For uh, Steve, could you go over how long you have the, the range again and then when you give it up for the uh, Delta and Atlas and when you would get it back? Okay. Um, like I said, we have four attempts in essentially five days. Uh, we will stand down on the 15th um, for, the, for the Delta folks to do their uh, F-1 checks on the range, and then they'll go ahead with their first launch attempt on the 16th. So um, we have a nominal support plan for four attempts in five days. Delta will come in there, and then we'll be able to hopefully get in there uh, between the Delta and the Atlas with two attempts if necessary. Thank you. And I wondered if you could uh, go over the hold down post issue as it stands at this point. Have you cleared that or is that still an item that's open? Well, actually, um, the technical community presents their final rationale for flight um, at the L-2 meeting today. Um, that's at 2 o'clock. And then they'll come back to, the, to this conference here in this forum and brief uh, all the specific details. We are confident in our SDS-113 configuration, and uh, we're ready to go for launch. Okay, other questions? Okay, Dan? And Dan Billow from WESH TV. You lost me a little bit on the, on the range thing. You have the 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th. That's four days. Could you make a launch attempt on the 15th while at the same time, well, later in the day that the Delta guys could do their thing? Uh, actually, the, the way it sits is uh, with roughly just under 24 hours between launch attempts. On one of the days, you actually get two launch attempts in the same day, but it's essentially 24-hour separation. So we go um, the morning of the 11th, the morning of the 12th, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how we get four attempts in essentially five days. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the STS-113 pre-launch press conference here to discuss the events surrounding the upcoming STS-113 countdown and space shuttle mission are Ron Didamore, the shuttle program manager from NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Bob Cabana, the International Space Station Deputy Program Manager from NASA's Johnson Space Center, Mike Wetmore, the Director of Shuttle Processing from the Kennedy Space Center, and Lieutenant Darren Murphy, the Launch Weather Officer from the 45th Weather Squadron. And we'll begin first with Ron Didamore. Ron? 
Thanks. Uh, as you know, we have just completed our uh, launch minus two day mission management team meeting. And I'm pleased to report that uh, the team is not working any issues. All systems are go and, and we're looking forward to a, a good launch on Monday morning. And uh, as I look back on this year and, and pause to reflect that, that STS-113 represents the concluding flight for this calendar year, uh, I continue to be amazed at all the good things that uh, this program has accomplished. Uh, I look back and see that, that at the landing of STS-13, we will have conducted 18 spacewalks, more than any other year from the shuttle perspective. And we will have launched 90,000 pounds of upmass to the uh, International Space Station. Uh, as a, a good friend of mine would say, that's good stuff. And uh, I really agree with him. This, this year has been exce an exceptional year, and it really is good stuff being in the space business today. Thank you, Ron. Bob? Thank you. Well, it's always nice to come down to Florida and support a space shuttle launch. Uh, having been absent for a while, I'd like to echo what Ron said. I think if you look back on uh, the space station that we had on orbit uh, a year ago and the space station we have on orbit now, and look at what we've accomplished. It's uh, truly phenomenal, the success that we've had. And it, uh, it just goes to the, the team uh, that NASA has working together to make this happen and all our international partners pulling together. Uh, the ISS program's on track. Uh, things are looking good. Uh, the only issue that we're working uh, that was brought up here at the L-2 review is a problem with the CEDRA that uh, some of you are aware of. Uh, I'll say that uh, we're working it. Uh, we've got plenty of uh, LIO on board to uh, scrub the carbon dioxide out uh, for a full mission, and uh, we're taking uh, a couple of spare valves up to uh, help repair the CEDRA and get it back on track. So uh, we have no constraints to the launch of SCS-113. Uh, the crew is uh, ready to go, and the crew on orbit's ready to uh, have them and uh, get started on another uh, stage up there. So with that, I'll say we're ready to go. All right. Thank you, Bob. And now Mike Wetmore from KSC. Well, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. This is my first opportunity to support the team in this new role, and uh, I'm really excited about the team that I get to support. We have the best group of contractors and civil servants uh, here in, at Kennedy and within the space shuttle program that I've ever worked with and I'm excited about an opportunity to, to lead some of those folks and to work with the rest. Um, we've had a great year. Uh, this has been a nice, clean flow, and uh, we have a lot of exciting work in front of us, starting with the launch on Monday morning. Okay, thank you, Mike. And a look now at the weather forecast for Monday. Lieutenant Darren Murphy from the 45th Weather Squadron. Thank you, and, and weather at the 45th is looking forward to supporting the launch as well. For the launch day itself, the tanking has a uh, has scattered clouds at 3,000 feet with winds out of the southwest at 8 gusting to 12. There's a slight chance of showers, but only 5% of a uh, emission criteria met. For the launch date itself, we'll have scattered at 3,000 feet, scattered at 10,000 feet, and winds will be out of the north or southwest at 8 knots gusting to 12 as well. We'll have a uh, chance for isolated showers and the probability of meeting launch criteria will be 20%. For the SRB recovery, we'll have scattered clouds at 2,000 feet, winds out of the southwest, 12 gusting to 14, and the seas will be 3 feet. For our Kona support sites, we'll have uh, good conditions at Edwards, and uh, also our secondary uh, sites will be scattered at uh, 4,000, and scattered at 25,000. Uh, good conditions for both those sites are overseas sites, broken at 8,000, and, uh, and good at our, our secondary overseas site as well. For the 24-hour delay for the launch, we'll have uh, scattered clouds at 030 or 3,000 feet, scattered at 10,000. The winds will remain out of the southwest at 12 gusting to 18. We'll have a chance of isolated showers and our launch criteria uh, probability of being met for a scrub on that day will be 30%. Uh, we've got a front coming down that uh, is producing some uh, weather as it comes, uh, tightening our gradients. And for the 48-hour delay, for the cloud layers, we'll be scattered to broken at 3,000 feet, broken at 10,000 feet, and broken at 25,000 feet. 
probability on this day is 60%, uh, meeting crosswind criteria as well as thunderstorms and precip within the proximity of the pad. For our overseas sites, they also have uh, criteria being met for uh, chance of showers within 20 nautical miles of the, of the landing strip there. Okay, thank you, Lieutenant Murphy. We're ready now to take questions and answers. Please uh, give your name and affiliation with when the microphone comes to you. We'll start here with uh, Marcia. Um, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press for Bob. Um, there seems to be a lot of doom and gloom reports out of Russia lately about how they're not going to be able to afford any more Soyuz and limited progress. And I'm just wondering, do you get a sense that things are really any worse than they've ever been? And that just, this is just political posturing or are things really pretty dire there and how's NASA going to try to help Russia get out of this hole if it really exists? Well, Marcia, uh, they do have a challenge in front of them, but uh, so far the Russian Space Agency has uh, not given NASA any indication that they aren't going to meet their commitments to the International Space Station program. So uh, hopefully they'll be able to work through this and, uh, and we'll continue to see them uh, meet their commitments. At this time, uh, although they're challenged, uh, I think uh, they're going to be able to come through. Do you, do you get the sense that they're any more challenged than they've ever been? I mean, do things really seem worse this past couple months than usual? I don't think the last couple of months are uh, any different than the, uh, the last year has been. Uh, I think they do have uh, uh, some issues with uh, meeting all their commitments uh, for their uh, contractors to pull all the uh, hardware together, but uh, so far they're, uh, they're able to do that. Stefano? Stefano Corridor, New York Times and Positive Mechanics. Uh, uh, how did you convince yourselves that the hold down posts and uh, the explosive bolts uh, are going to work? Uh, I mean, how, what did you do? How did you reach that conclusion? I think the, uh, the best way to answer that is uh, you have to go back and think about we have two different vehicles that we're talking about. One that launched an SDS 112 where we had the problem. On, on the hold down post and STS-113 is a different orbiter. Uh, it's a different uh, mobile launch platform, so they're completely different systems. And we have done a thorough job of checking out the system that we plan to launch on uh, STS-113 on Monday. Uh, we had a heightened awareness that we could have the possibility of a, of a wiring or cable problem and we uh, took extraordinary steps to check out all the wiring, all the cabling. Uh, did extra tests of the mating interfaces and satisfied ourselves that we're good to go. And uh, an unrelated question. Um, I read something uh, the other day about uh, combining the budgets of uh, shuttle station and the future SLI. Uh, what can you tell about it? Uh, I don't know anything about that. Okay. Phil? Phil Chen Earth News uh, for Bob O'Ron. Uh, how are you planning on handling the carbon dioxide situation uh, during the joint dock period right now? Is the shuttle going to handle all of the scrubbing? Are you going to use the canisters already aboard the space station or what? Uh, okay, so the way we're working it is the, the Vosduk uh, provides the scrubbing for the three crew members on the space station and then we supplement the Vosduk with uh, lithium uh, hydroxide canisters. Uh, Right now, between the supply that we have on station and the ones that we're carrying up with the orbiter, should the CEDRA completely fail the carbon dioxide removal system on the U.S. lab on the space station, we have enough uh, LIOH canisters to get uh, a full dock mission with all the crew members on board and uh, the three uh, extra days uh, past stand mission to ensure uh, good landing support. Uh, Right now, the CEDRA is operating in a degraded mode with uh, some special commanding. Uh, we're still formulating the exact plan that we're going to use to uh, repair the CEDRA. That's in work, but uh, more than likely what we'll end up doing is we're flying two valves up uh, that were flown down from Huntsville uh, for the CEDRA. And uh, during the turnover between uh, Peggy Whitson and uh, Ken Bowersox, uh, we'll probably end up changing out those valves. The mission operations team is still pulling the final plan together. So CEDRA is working in a degraded mode, uh, scrubbing some of the carbon dioxide. Uh, the Vosduk is fully functional and uh, will supplement with uh, LIO as required, but it's no impact to the mission. 
Okay, so uh, I understand the Vazduk, uh, the, the Russians have uh, uh, defined it by Vazduk 3, 4, 5, depending on how many people can handle, and if you know what level is at, and how many uh, people can the Cedra handle. And I had heard that 25 days of uh, LIHOS, I assume that's uh, 75 man days, um, uh, is the, the supply on space station right now? Uh, right now, the Vazduk takes care of uh, three people. The Cedra when it's fully functional, was designed for six and can handle anywhere from seven to eight. And then uh, the Lyle that we have on board, uh, as I said, we have enough to support the uh, full dock mission without seed operating, and then we have uh, extra Lyle to protect for a uh, Vosduke failure. Chris? Chris Kreidler from Florida today. My question is for Ron. Uh, NASA released a press release today saying it was amending its 2003 budget to implement a new space uh, transportation plan. And they also said that they were asking for increasing an increase in the shuttle flight rate. I wondered if you asked for more flights, and if so, why? Well, I'm not familiar with the press release at this time. We've been in management meetings all day, so it's premature for me to comment on that. Uh, as far as the flight rate, uh, both the shuttle and station programs have been working together on the flight rate uh, that, that is required to support the uh, station assembly and then the logistics uh, for the out years. Uh, and that has been uh, working its way through uh, the agency under certain uh, being reviewed at all the levels. And um, I believe that uh, we're getting ready to uh, determine exactly what flight rate we're going to need for the uh, coming years. Um, I realize you haven't seen the press release, but uh, the plan also calls for additional investments in shuttle upgrades, and I wondered what maybe you hope to see happen in terms of upgrades under a new plan. Well, I, I certainly like what you have said. I always like investing in the shuttle program and investing in upgrades and supportability and, and uh, sustaining the system that we have. Uh, but at this time, I can't comment on that and look forward to seeing what the, all that's about. Dan? Uh, Dan Dillo at uh, Channel 2 for Mr. Didimore. Uh, uh, almost the same questions you answered before. I, I want to try it a little bit different way on the hold down posts and explosive nuts. Often you personally insist on, on an explanation as to what happened the last time before you want to go ahead and, and go with something you don't really understand. Uh, what, what's different about this? Let's uh, let's compare this a little bit to the flow liner uh, situation that we had this summer. When we first identified a flow liner problem on uh, Atlantis, we called a timeout and we asked ourselves, do we have any evidence on another orbiter that would indicate we have more than a single event? And when we went and looked at uh, Columbia, we did identify some additional flow liner cracks, and right then and there we knew we had more than a one vehicle situation. Uh, when I looked at the pyro uh, problem, we knew we had some type of electrical problem on the orbiter MLP combination for SDS-112. So the first thing we did is consistent with the flow liners. We went over to another vehicle, another MLP, and searched high and low to see if we had any indication of a problem, and we could find none. We went to, to, we took greater, greater steps uh, with that heightened awareness I talked to you about. Did additional tests. Uh, on the vehicle that we're going to fly and satisfied ourselves that, uh, that we did not have any problems in the circuits, both the A and B circuits. This morning I spent uh, several hours walking down the MLP, looking at the cables, going into the lab, uh, having, the, having a briefing of the cables that we have pulled out of the STS-12 MLP and having our engineers brief me on exactly uh, what they have found and what they have not found. And I'm satisfied that we have done everything that we can do. We believe that the most probable uh, cause is at the interface, the T0 umbilical. And unfortunately, we cannot recreate that interface because right at liftoff, it's, it's pulled away and uh, all you can do is look at both interfaces and retest it. Uh, but I'm satisfied based on the testing that uh, that the most probable cause is at the T0 interface. Because of that, we've taken extra steps on the T0 interface on STS-113 uh, to not only uh, 
uh, inspect it, but to actually use boroscope techniques to make sure the mating has been done properly and, to, and that the mating is secure. Uh, and as we have worked through this situation with the engineering, technical, and safety folks, everybody has concluded that we're safe to fly. Craig? Craig Cavalt, Aviation Week, and I have one for both uh, Ron and Bob. Uh, Ron, again, downstream bureaucratic programmatic stuff. Now that the competitive source report has pretty been out and looked at to, with some initial degree here, what, what kind of action is being done to sort through what they have uh, come up with? For me personally and the space shuttle program, our efforts and focus have been predominantly STS-112 and STS-113. Uh, once we launch STS-113, we are prepared to go into a series of discussions to discuss what you just mentioned, competitive sourcing, uh, the, the discussion of the RAND report. But as of this date, we have not done it, and we will plan to do that and conduct those sessions following the launch period. Okay, and, and for, for Bob, a, a big picture uh, thing on the, on the programmatics of the ISS program, not so much the success of the engineering flight ops this year. If you look at, at where the program has, was perhaps a year ago in a programmatic planning and course ahead versus where it is now going into 03, are there some things you'd want to highlight that are now um, kind of in the bag in a decision sense that were not earlier? Well, I think uh, following the uh, uh, Tom Young report in uh, the commission that reviewed the program, uh, we are in solid uh, footing to meet our schedule and uh, deliver as we've expected, as we predicted. Um, we've answered all the questions. Uh, we've got a, a solid budget. The hardware is tracking well. Um, I think uh, the team has uh, gone back and looked at what needs to get done to be uh, where we have to be to provide Node 2 on time and complete uh, U.S. Corps complete in the spring of uh, 04. So I'd say we're on a, a very solid footing uh, budget-wise. Uh, the team's done an outstanding job. Uh, I think uh, we've shown that and uh, we'll deliver on uh, what we said we were going to do. Bill? Uh, Bill R with CBS, so two quick ones for Bob. And I've been out of the loop for a little while, Bob. Is the Electron back up and running uh, yet? No, it's not. The Electron is uh, still down. Uh, we have the spare parts on board to uh, fix it. And, of course, Electron is the Russian uh, equipment that provides oxygen to the crew on board the space station. Uh, without the Electron, uh, between the uh, airlock, uh, the progress, and uh, our uh, SVOG uh, canisters, we've got enough for 400 man days on orbit. Uh, so I think we've got plenty of O2 to uh, take care of the crew and uh, provide time to uh, repair the electron and get it up and running. Can, and just related, how, how far can you go before you have to burn a candle in, in a worst case scenario? I'm just wondering how far the progress in airlock get you in a worst case scenario. I, I don't have that answer for you right now. And my last question along the same lines, though, I was just curious to follow Phil Chin as to how many uh, Lyle canisters are on the station after STS-113 leaves in the event of a subsequent Vosduk failure. I'm just wondering what reserve sure. you have. Uh, right now, uh, there are 25 uh, Lyle canisters, U.S. Lyle canisters, uh, stored on the space station. And uh, we may end up using one more of those to uh, supplement the uh, Vosduk for the Doc Docs ops with the uh, taxi crew that's up there but we may not have to uh, with this uh, partial sea drops that we have going on. Uh, the shuttle is bringing up an additional uh, 31 uh, canisters of Lyle. Uh, to support, uh, we need uh, 53 uh, Lyle cans. So uh, you can see we've got uh, about um, three left over in a total Cedra fail case after the shuttle leaves. Uh, so uh, we don't rely on the U.S. Lyo. Uh, we also have a 15-day supply of Russian Lyo canisters on board that support the Vazduk. So that's only if the Vazduk fails, then we would start using uh, Russian Lyo to support it. So we're in a good position. All right, there are no questions at the other centers. Have we any additional questions here at KSC? Phil, a follow-up? 
Ocean, Earth is uh, for Ron Didimore. Can you tell me about uh, what uh, role Jerry Elliott uh, plays in your office and what kind of a job he does for you? Jerry works in our uh, management integration group. Uh, he's predominantly involved with configuration management, configuration control, uh, which is an important function in our office. As you know, we have uh, a fair amount of documentation, and if we didn't keep it all up to date and uh, and manage properly, then uh, we might slip something through the cracks. So Jerry is involved in our configuration control and management aspects of the program. Chris? Um, you mentioned the flow liners. Have you had a chance to look at Atlantis' flow liners yet? We did uh, have the opportunity this week to uh, both look at them uh, uh, under 10x inspection, eddy current, and all looks fine. Any further questions? Marcia. Well, Marcia, then, um, for Ron, um, does the January date still look pretty solid for Columbia? Are there any threats to that or changes of mind about when it should fly? I think we've targeted January the 16th, and that looks pretty good right now. Good morning, everyone. This is the launch countdown status briefing for L minus two days for STS 113. Here to bring us the status this morning is Pete Nikolenko, NASA test director. Good morning. Scott Higginbotham, the STS 113 payload mission manager. Good morning. And Kathy Winters, the shuttle weather officer from the Department of the Air Force. Good morning. And we'll first begin with Pete Nikolenko and the shuttle status. Thank you, George. Uh, good morning. I'm pleased to be here today to provide countdown status for the launch of Endeavour to the International Space Station for our next assembly mission and expedition crew exchange. Uh, the countdown is continuing in progress. We're right on schedule and we're tracking no technical issues. Uh, earlier this morning, we completed the servicing of our fuel cell cryo storage tanks. We're currently back in the pad and are picking up with our pad closeouts and space shuttle main engine systems checks. Our remaining standard closeout uh, countdown activities scheduled for later today and tomorrow include the power up and check out of our ground communications network later tonight, the retraction of the rotating service structure early tomorrow morning, and preparations for ET cryogenic load, which will take place Sunday afternoon. Following ET load on Sunday, we'll continue with final preparations for the flight crew arrival at the pad scheduled for Sunday evening. The launch period is four hours in duration and extends from midnight Sunday until 4 a.m. Monday morning, with our actual launch occurring during that uh, launch period. This is an 11-day mission with end of mission landing scheduled to occur here at Kennedy Space Center on the evening of November 21st. In summary, all our hardware and flight and ground systems are in great shape. We are tracking no technical issues. Our teams are ready, and we're all looking forward to a successful launch and mission. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. And now for the payload status, Scott Higginbotham. Thank you, George, and good morning, everyone. I'd like to begin this morning with a brief video summary of the P1 truss processing flow. So if we could roll that tape, please. The construction of the P-1 truss began back in 1997. The element was delivered to KSC aboard NASA's Super Guppy aircraft on July 26th of the year 2000. It was then delivered to our operations and checkout building. Uh, it was moved to the space station processing facility last year, and here you can see some images in April when we installed our thermal radiators on the truss for flight. These radiators will be deployed not on this flight, but further on downstream to provide the heat rejection capability for the thermal control system. The STS-113 flight crew came to KSC many times during the launch vehicle and payload preparations for this flight to test the tools and techniques they'll use during the mission. Over the years, we found it ex it's extremely useful for them to match up their training to the actual flight hardware that they'll be using during the flight. Once all of our work on the element was done, on the 3rd of October, we lifted the P-1 up out of its test stand and installed it into our transportation canister. The canister was then rotated to vertical, and on the 10th of October, we delivered the payload to the pad. Here you can see the canister being hoisted up into the rotating service structure. 
On the 15th of October, we installed the element into the orbiter, and after our final closeouts, the payload bay doors were closed for flight on the 18th of October. And that brings us up to where we are today, P1 and our secondary payload, the MEMS-based PICA satellite inspector, are both buttoned up, closed out, and ready for flight in the payload bay of Endeavour. We have no further activities associated with those two elements during the countdown. Our last remaining activity will occur early tomorrow morning when we will install our ISS utilization mid-deck experiments into Endeavour. Once that work is complete tomorrow morning, the entire 11A payload launch package will be on board and ready for flight. In conclusion, we're not working any issues or concerns from an ISS perspective at this point, and our entire team is looking forward to a launch on Monday. George? Thank you, Scott. And now for the weather forecast. Kathy? Thank you. It's a beautiful day here today at Kennedy Space Center. The temperatures all morning of the pad have been in the low 70s with uh, no, no weather in the area. We are expecting an increasing uh, chance for showers beginning tomorrow, uh, and that is a slight concern for launch. And then the temperature, uh, excuse me, the weather then uh, degrades somewhat the next couple of days beyond that. Looking at our satellite picture, we do have very good weather out there today and, uh, and some moisture down to the south and off to the west of Florida and we expect some of that to creep into the area tomorrow. And uh, as we look into the tanking forecast, weather is looking very good for tanking with scattered skies and nice light winds, just a slight chance to get an isolated shower in the area at that time. Probability of uh, violating our constraints for tanking is 5%. And then for launch, uh, we also are looking for those isolated showers again to be in the area. And uh, te temperature at that time will be 75 degrees, but just scattered skies generally with those isolated showers around and a 20% chance of KOC weather prohibiting launch. And for the SRB recovery uh, forecast, we do have uh, some winds, 12 peaking up to 15 knots with some isolated showers in the area and seas at 4 feet. And then from Spaceflight Meteorology Group, we do have our CONUS weather, and everything looks good at both um, White Sands and at Edwards. And for the Tau sites, we are still concerned at Zaragoza for chance for showers within 20 nautical miles. If we do happen to delay 24 hours, we still are generally expecting scattered skies, but we do have a little more chance of getting those showers into our area. Although they should be uh, isolated, they'll be a little bit more out there than we expected the day before with a 30% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. And for the uh, Kona sites, weather is looking good at both the Kona sites again on day two. And the Tau sites, both sites, are expect we are expecting some showers within 20 nautical miles at both Tau sites. And finally, if we do delay 48 hours, uh, the weather does degrade with the frontal boundary moving in from the west. And with that, we do have a lot of cloud layers expected and also showers and also a chance for isolated thunderstorms. And with that, we also can violate our crosswind constraint on this day. So with that, we have a 60% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. For the Kona sites, though, they still look good for the third day. And for the Tau sites, uh, still expecting those uh, showers within 20 nautical miles. So overall, uh, in summary, the first day of launch is the best looking day for both launch and for the uh, Tau sites. And that concludes my briefing. All right, Kathy, now we're ready to take questions. Please give your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. Marsha? Marsha Dunn, Associated Press for Scott. Do you know if the two valves uh, for the station have been loaded into the shuttle yet? They did arrive uh, as expected. They were packaged and placed into the locker. I don't know whether that locker has actually been placed aboard, but it may actually happen today. Uh, the latest opportunity they would have to place it on board would be during our late experiment stowage operation, but as of right now, I'm not aware of any plans to do it that late, so that would say that today is the day. And there have been no other last-minute additions uh, other than that? There has been another oh, addition. There was a, a blanket for a DC to DC converter unit on the S0 truss segment that was flown down yesterday by our program manager, in fact. And uh, it's being be also being stowed today, and that will be potentially installed during the third EVA during the mission. During some thermal analysis, they've concluded that there is a small period of time in the latter part of the year where the uh, temperature constraints for this box may be violated, and so they're flying up this blanket to install to avoid any uh, potential damage to that box during that time frame. It's just one blanket for one box on the S0? Yes. Nothing for S1? Nothing for us. Okay, thank you. Mark? 
uh, Mark Caro from the Houston Chronicle for uh, Kathy Winters. Is your forecast uh, for tomorrow, or, I'm sorry, for the launch period, the four-hour launch period, is there a trend within that four hours where the showers are more likely at one part or another? Or is that a blanket? Forecast. That's just a blanket forecast. It's, there's no significant weather feature that is bringing those showers in. So we're just mainly looking at a lot of moisture in the atmosphere. And a lot of times when we get uh, high pressure in the area, we get these small areas of convergence where we see some showers. And so it's not it's not any one significant feature that would bring it through at a particular time. Peter. Peter King, CBS News Radio. Kathy, just just a quick question: Is your forecast for the entire window, or is that for, or is your forecast for the optimum launch time? It is for the launch window, not the four-hour window, but the actual launch window. Any further questions? Shuttle launch control at T minus two hours, 18 minutes, 42 seconds. And holding, we have declared a scrub for tonight. The launch team is not able to get comfortable with the problem of this liquid oxygen, or I'm sorry, uh, gaseous oxygen leak to the crew cabin. So we will uh, not complete boarding the crew. And uh, as soon as we can get the crew off the pad, then we'll begin to drain the external tank from Space Shuttle Endeavor. Good evening, everyone. This is our post-scrub press conference for our first launch attempt for STS-113. Here to bring us the status of Endeavor and to discuss what happened is the Space Shuttle Program Manager, Ron Didimore from the Johnson Space Center, and Mike Lonbach, Space Shuttle Launch Director from the Kennedy Space Center. And we'll begin first with Ron Didimore. Well, it <clears throat> sure is disappointing to come to uh, talk with you tonight and tell you that we're not in a position to launch. Uh, it sure was a good evening to go have a, a launch and a, and a good start to a, a fantastic space mission we all anticipate. However, uh, tonight, uh, just, to, just after we started tanking uh, the external tank, um, the launch team identified uh, some indications of a, uh, an oxygen leak, a small O2 leak in the mid-body. Uh, and as we uh, have trouble Shooted that uh, particular problem over the last several hours, it became apparent to us that uh, we were going to have to stand down and understand exactly what was going on. Uh, to be more specific, there are uh, two oxygen supply systems uh, that provide uh, oxygen from the mid body into the crew cabin. Both of these supply systems are checked out in the orbiter processing facility, and both of them checked out. Uh, okay, uh, and then sometime 
just prior to tanking, we open up some valves that allows the oxygen to start flowing into the cabin. And at that point uh, is, is where we had indications of, a, of an oxygen leak. Uh, to date, uh, our troubleshooting indicates the leak is in uh, supply system two. The leak rate appears to be about 600 standard cubic inches per minute, which is about one pound an hour. Uh, and, uh, but even more than the leak rate, the problem that we were struggling with tonight was understanding why uh, that the, uh, the system showed the good integrity during the uh, orbiter processing facility check. Uh, but when we opened the valves and uh, proceeded to flow oxygen in the late hours here, just as we started tanking, we, uh, we saw an, an increase in the O2 rate as far as O2 being leaked into the mid-body. So we need to just stop right now and, um, and understand what is going on. We're going to uh, open the payload bay doors. We're going to go in and inspect, which means we're going to detank uh, both the external tank and the uh, cryos over the next couple of days so that we can get access to the payload bay and have the folks go in and start uh, uh, inspecting and troubleshooting. Uh, Based on uh, the preliminary timeline that we have looked at and talked to, uh, with Mike and his team about uh, when we could be uh, ready to launch again and factoring in the availability of the range, uh, we determined that it's going to be about a seven-day delay. So we're, we are going to spend the rest of this week uh, uh, finding what the issue is and looking into it and trying to understand it. Uh, and uh, and fixing it, and uh, and then we'll put ourselves uh, back in a launch posture about seven days from today. All right. Thank you, Ron. Mike. Well, nothing much to add other other than repeating what Ron said about uh, being disappointed. We have to tell you about a, a scrub tonight instead of the standard post-launch press conference. Uh, it is disappointing for the team, but I'm very proud of the team and the troubleshooting we went through when we first did detect this leak and the amount of uh, intensive investigation we've already done on this system to try to isolate it uh, and, we're, and are looking forward to getting hands on the system to repair it. Um, so over the next two days is a fairly standard uh, scrub for us. We'll be detanking the external tank uh, that's in work right now. Uh, we will be offloading the PRSD cryo system in preparation for hands on of, of the system that is leaking somewhat. Uh, and then be able to get our hands on the system, I believe, about Wednesday morning or so. So until then, uh, it's, it's standard uh, scrub turnaround activities for us. Once we have our hands on the system and, and have identified where the leak is, we'll have a better idea uh, of what it takes to fix that leak. So uh, other than that, uh, disappointing, but we're going to do the right thing and fix the leak on the ground. All right. Thank you, Mike. We're ready to take questions. Please give your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. We'll start here with Hi, this is Chris Kreisler from Florida today. Do you foresee having to remove the payload in order to address the problem? We talked about that this evening, and um, we believe that it's not necessary to remove the payload at this time. As we open the payload bay doors and get a better understanding of where we think the leak uh, most likely uh, is located, uh, Mike and his team will reevaluate that. And, uh, and we'll determine later this week whether that's the prudent thing to do. If we were to remove the payload, it's, it's going to be a further impact in, as far as the launch date on what I've previously talked to you about. How confident are you in a week's delay next Sunday as a launch date? I'd say about an hour's worth of confidence. <laughs> Miles? Exactly what does this uh, oxygen supply? Is it inside, in terms of the suits? Is this cabin oxygen? And um, the, the two systems, are they fully redundant? Could you have launched if you'd shut this one down and just gone with one? These two systems uh, supply the oxygen to the cabin. Um, for the, uh, They supply oxygen to the suit when the crew is in the suit, and they also supply oxygen to the cabin when the crew is not in the suit. So it is the primary means by which the uh, crew has the oxygen supply uh, when they're, when they're uh, both on the ground and in orbit uh, when the uh, hatch is closed. Uh, they are redundant supply lines. However, during ascent and, and landing timeframes, we tie both systems together for maximum flow 
uh, while the crew is uh, in their uh, launch and entry suits. So that's the only time we really tie them both together, and that is our standard procedure, and that's what we would have desired to do today. Uh, once we get on orbit, we can isolate one system from the other. Uh, even during our troubleshooting period uh, this evening, we closed both systems and isolated them, and that's why we were able to pinpoint that the problem was in system two rather than system one. So they are redundant. They're completely isolatable from each other, but uh, typically both for S and an entry, we tie them all together. And uh, the suits are 100 percent O2, is that right? And, there's, and the cabin atmosphere is air? The cabin is uh, a mixture of O2 and N2, basically the air mixture. Uh, and the suits are 100 percent O2 as far as their uh, emergency oxygen supply. Mike? Mike Cabbage with the Orlando Sentinel. I just wanted to make sure that I understood the, a little more exactly the time frame. When you say about a week, um, as you know, Delta IV is on the range this coming Saturday, and then assuming a 24-hour reconfiguration, would it be the earliest you could make another attempt would be the night of Monday the 18th? We've told our team that uh, the target for the 18th, uh, for the reasons you just mentioned, we know the Delta is there on the 16th, and uh, uh, we'll know more this week. Mike said he was going to get back with us uh, on Wednesday at noon, and we'll have a better understanding how far he has progressed and his team and uh, what is involved with the uh, repair and uh, whether or not we'll be able to make the dates we just mentioned. Stephen? Stephen Young with spaceflightnow.com. Um, what, what is there in this line that could be leaking? Are there particular valves that um, may be suspect? Or it, could it be that the line itself has ruptured, perhaps been trodden on, or some kind of damage in processing? Uh, well, it's not ruptured because um, 600 uh, standard cubic inches a minute is a, is a fairly small leak when you're talking about a pipe that's broken. Uh, but when you're talking about the types of leaks that we look for, and we're, we're talking about very, very small leaks, 600 cubic inches a minute is, is uh, larger than we would like to ever see. It did not represent a safety hazard. It was way below the limits that we would classify as a hazard from a flammability standpoint. but. Uh, out of family from what we expect to see in this time frame of the count. And, and if you have to get in there and replace a valve, is that something you can do out of the pad, or um, what, what are you what are you looking at as far as most your likely options are most likely not a valve type situation. Uh, there are some flexible lines uh, in in the area that we think is most probable. Um, Mike can probably talk about it more than I. They've they've had uh, these type of repair scenarios come up in the past, and, and they could uh, do wonders as far as making simple repairs uh, without uh, going to great lengths to pull out a lot of plumbing. Yeah, it could be as simple as, as a seal on the flex lines that Ron mentioned, uh, or it could be a liner tube fitting on another portion of the line, either one of which is accessible with the plan that we have in place to uh, to get under the neath, underneath the payload bay liner to get to these lines. So once we get access, uh, the repair itself will probably be fairly simple. It's the problem of, of getting detanked and getting the access and then getting back into a launch countdown that takes us all the way out to next Monday. The repair itself will probably go uh, very quick. Mark? I think it's Mark Carreau from the Houston Chronicle. I'm, I'm not sure which one I should ask, but probably Mike Leinbach. Could you kind of describe a little bit about what's involved? It's sort of hard to envision uh, what the techs and engineers would have to do with the with the truss in the payload bay. Do they have to sort of crawl underneath and remove flooring panels, or what's involved in reaching this area? Well, we have the uh, payload ground handling mechanism in our in our uh, payload changeout room. On the, on the pig on the payload ground handling mechanism, there's another platform that we can deploy up and down and in and out, and that will get us as close to this area as possible. And there's actually a space of about uh, two or three feet that's, that's open between the top of the P1 truss and the bottom of the orbiter docking system. So there's actually a clear zone in there where we can deploy this particular platform. 
and then get the technicians out at the end of the platform uh, and get hands on the payload bay liners and, and remove those liners to, to get hands on the system itself. So it's a somewhat of a tight squeeze, but uh, we've had the guys look at it already. We have them working on a, on a CAD model to make sure, at least in this preliminary stage, that we think we have a good plan in place. Proof of the pudding is going to be once we get out there and the payload bay doors are open and, and we get out there and, and uh, see how much access we need in addition to this CAP platform to uh, get hands on the system. If, if we can mention it, uh, these two systems, uh, O2 supply systems, where we think the most probable location for us to go in and hunt for uh, a leak is just aft of the 576 bulkhead. So it's, um, if you were looking at the orbiter on the pad, it's just down from the bulkhead and above the orbiter docking system. There's about two or three bays between that and the orbiter docking system that Mike and his folks are going to go in there and look. The uh, truss element itself is aft of the docking system, so we're way above that area. Bill? Uh, Bill R. with CBS. Yeah, um, Ryan, just to follow that up, I, I'm still a little bit confused about a, where you think the issue is? I take it from what you're saying, it's it's above uh, the aft end of the docking system, um, but I'm not sure about that. And the second thing is, why? What makes you think the problem is in that area? Obviously, you have some reason to believe that. Well, when we uh, loaded the cryos, that whole area aft of the docking system had an opportunity to leak, and it was solid. Did not leak, and no indications of a leak. It wasn't until later on when we open up some valves in the area that I talked to you about that's, uh, let's say it's north of the docking system. When we open those valves, that's when we got the indication of the O2 leak. So uh, then Mike and his team went through a troubleshooting plan and they isolated both systems and then opened up the system too. Uh, when we isolated both systems, the leak went away. We opened up system two, the leak came back. So we have a pretty good idea that it's uh, north of the truss, north of the uh, orbiter docking system. And, and just to restate the obvious, your, your tentative no earlier than the 18th obviously assumes that uh, when your guys get in there that you can, in fact, um, do whatever it is you're talking about here. I mean, that, that's the best case assumption at this point. Yeah, our, our plan actually has almost two days of hands-on activity. It's five full shifts of hands-on activity, and that still supports the Monday 18th launch. So. Again, as I say, the trick is going to be getting there. The work itself, I'd, I feel confident, will be pretty quick. So in a week's delay, you've got uh, two days we've mapped out for the repair, and the rest of the time is getting there and getting back up to launch. Roger Gilmet, space.com. A uh, November 18th launch attempt would result in a landing on or about Thanksgiving or over the Thanksgiving weekend. Day right? after day after. Do you foresee any problems with, with staffing pre-planned vacations? And does that any have any influence? No, I, I would expect them to be well fed for landing. <laughs> uh, Keith Cowing, NASAWatch.com. Uh, you're looking for a leak. Are you going to be pressurizing the system with an indicator of gas or something to look for that? Or how do you go about actually finding a leak other than just looking for a hole? Well, no, we will be pressurizing the system with helium uh, to, to find this particular leak. Uh, it's, a, it's a type of leak where we may get an audible indication, we may not, but we'll have a, a mass spectrometer with us and be able to run the mass spec, the whole length of the line. And, and, at, and in, at first, of course, we'll be looking at the joints. That's the most likely area for a leak. Uh, so, yeah, we will be pressurizing, but not with liquid oxygen or, or gaseous oxygen. With the size of this leak, it should be pre pretty easy uh, to spot where it's at. Kelly? Um, looking ahead, what kind of bait angle restrictions do you have till the end of the year? Let's see, I think the bait angle uh, starts coming into play in the second week of December. So we've still got plenty of time. Phil? Delta North is, uh, what are the plans uh, for the flight crew over here? Are they going to stay over here, go back to Houston? Uh, I assume they're going to stay in isolation. And I believe the schedule, the, has anybody notified the space station crew yet? And any comments from them about to uh, well, change I'm, your I'm not aware that uh, they've notified the, the space station crew. I don't even know if, if they're in a 
sleep cycle or uh, or awake period. But uh, if they're awake, I'm sure they know by now because it's easily uh, that'd be the news of the day for them. Uh, as far as the uh, as far as the crew here, I know they're going to stay in quarantine. Um, whether or not they choose to go back to Houston, or not, I think they're still discussing that, but they are going to stay in quarantine. And so uh, for Mike, um, um, where are the actual uh, crosshairs uh, located in which bay uh, and roughly how much plumbing between uh, from where they are to the crew cabin? Well, we have five uh, liquid oxygen tanks and five liquid hydrogen tanks for the PRSD system. And, and they're scattered about and underneath the payload bay liner. There's one tank in bay three, uh, and then they're all manifolded together. Uh, so it, if we have to chase it further than where we think we have to go, that may be more troublesome. But again, the, tr the troubleshooting that we've done so far is fairly conclusive that, that we know where this leak is. Uh, we're not expecting to have to go any more extraordinary measures than we've already laid out for you. Dan? Uh, Dan Billow with West TV. A couple of real quick ones here just to make sure that I didn't get mixed up someplace. The oxygen's leaking into the payload bay, not, right? Okay. Correct. Uh, the seven-day delay figures out to a Sunday night launch or a Monday night? Monday. Monday night. And finally, do you have any concern at all that you, even a small concern, that you might have to roll off the launch pad and into the, into the barn? Well, it really is er too early to tell. And when Mike gets in there with his team, we'll, we'll know the facts. But uh, at this point, I don't, I don't believe that uh, we're at any significant risk of having to roll back. I think that this is the type of work that uh, the team is uh, trained and able to do at the launch pad. Jerry? Uh, Jerry Hamm from Time Magazine. Uh, could you give us a kind of a tick tock on this event? Uh, you started uh, tanking, and how quickly did this uh, leak appear? Well, we go through a, uh, a series of test uh, checks prior to actually getting the external tank load, uh, where we inert the payload bay and the, and the mid body itself, which is underneath the payload bay liners. That's about a four or five hour uh, exercise to inert the mid body. And we saw uh, what we thought was a slightly high O2 background in the mid-body, which is not unusual with a payload of this type. And so we, we declared that as our baseline O2 reading, which is our, our standard procedure. And we pressed into external tank prior load, expecting to see that, that that background level decreased over time. This is something that happens every launch countdown with a payload of this, of this type. Uh, in fact, what we saw was over the first hour or so, that the O2 concentration uh, crept up and did not creep down. So that was really the kind of first indication that we had something there. Stefano? Yes, uh, Stefano, close down New York Times, Hope you mechanics. Is the liquid oxygen you pump into the external tank the same that is going to circulate and get all the way up into the cabin, or are we talking about the different uh, uh, systems? No, these are, these are two entirely different systems. The, the liquid oxygen for the breathing oxygen is in our fuel cell system and the, and the cryogenics for that system. External tank is entirely different. Same type of propellants, different cleanliness levels, and two different independent systems. So the fact that you had this uh, leak as you were fueling is just totally coincidental? It's coincidental and it's tied to the time when we opened the valves that, that we talked about earlier um, and, and first got hit with the oxygen and, and that's when it started leaking a little bit. Not related to tanking itself. No. Okay, Bill has a follow-up in the back here. Um, how deep into the, if you look at the liner is zero, I mean how far into there do you have to go to where these, these Area, this area is located. I mean, a foot. I'm just trying to figure out how. I'm not sure we really know that yet. Uh, we were looking at some drawings before we came over. Uh, too crude yet for us to comment on that. Both Mike and I were sitting there talking about what we were going to do next, and we haven't got down to the engineering level to look at the drawings. So I don't really know yet, Bill. And also, just uh, just for a, I guess a really dumb question. I want to make sure I understand why you can't launch like this. Is this the case the crew runs out of oxygen? I mean, that's, I mean, is that the bottom line as a possibility here and it's a real bad day or is it just some redundancy that you like to have when you go into the flight?
but that you could, in theory, run the flight even like this? I think the, uh, the primary reason for us delaying today uh, was the fact that uh, we had done a pressure integrity check on this line already in the OPF, and uh, both lines had passed successfully. Uh, the last time we flew this vehicle, it, it worked fine. There were no leaks. Uh, and we had done uh, no work in these areas uh, that would cause us to, sus to have any suspicion of a, an area that might have had some rework that would have been an, a point for us to point to or at least look at for a leak. So, so uh, it's, it's like this leak just appeared out of the blue. Uh, for that alone, uh, and knowing that uh, you still have the shake, rattle, and roll to go through to get to orbit uh, caused us to pause and want to understand it better. Uh, granted, these are redundant systems. Uh, we could probably support this leak and not have any issue uh, either for ascent or for landing. Uh, it's the unknown why this happened after past the checks. Uh, did we have some collateral damage? Uh, is it worse? Is it trying to tell us something? Is it really worse than, than the data is indicating? We just couldn't go and launch in the blind, so we wanted to pause and take a look at it, and, and that really is the, the basic and dominant reason for delaying. Chris? Um, just to follow up on the earlier remarks, you talked about uh, Worrying that it didn't show up in tests, are you also going to be checking out other systems, your testing, computer systems, anything? No, I really believe the, uh, the OPF test is a fine test. It's a good test. Uh, the fact that it passed that test and then leaked today, something happened between. Um, did we cause it? Did we step on it? Did we drop something? Uh, did something come loose? Those are the types of things we'll be asking ourselves. But we need to go look and put our finger on it so we can tell you what the real answer is and for us to do corrective action. But we just don't know. All right. Uh, there are no further questions. I have been told in my earpiece that the space station crew has been told of the, uh, of the problem. And uh, they were rather matter of fact about it. Didn't didn't have a great deal of reaction. All right. That will conclude the briefing. Thank you. The uh, entire crew, Expedition 6, as well as STS-113, Mission Specialist 1, Michael Lopez Alegria, with Mission Specialist John Harrington, Pilot Paul Lockhart, our Commander Jim Weatherby, and our Expedition 6 crew members, Nikolai Buderin, Expedition 6 Commander Ken Bowersox, and Expedition 6 Mission Specialist Don Pettit. And our STS-113 emblems, the crew after breakfast, of course, their next activity is to 
get a briefing on the status of the weather and the countdown, and then they go and begin their sit-up activities. Michael Lopez Alegria. Commander Jim Weatherby. Next star pilot, Paul Lockhart. <laughs> Mission Specialist Expedition Crew Member uh, Nikolai Budarin from uh, Russia. Astronaut uh, Jim Harrington, John Harrington, and uh, lying down is Don Pettit. Of our Expedition Six crew members. So here they are leaving the suit up room headed for the elevator from the third down to the first floor. From Launch Complex 39 at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, this is Shuttle Launch Control at T minus two hours, 23 minutes, 50 seconds and counting. We are now entering the final three hours and 20 minutes of the countdown for the launch of Space Shuttle Endeavor on mission STS-113, the 16th mission for assembly of the International Space Station. The countdown is being controlled from firing room one once again here at the Launch Control Center. And we are on schedule for a 7.50 p.m. Eastern Time liftoff, weather permitting. This is the 19th flight for Space Shuttle Endeavor and the 112th mission of the Space Shuttle program since launches began in April of 1981. The primary objective of the STS-113 mission is to shuttle the Expedition 6 astronauts to the International Space Station 
and to carry the P1 truss, or Port 1 integrated truss segment, to the station. Based on a launch tonight, landing is scheduled to occur at 3.49 p.m. on the afternoon of Wednesday, December 4th, at a mission of elapsed time of 10 days, 19 hours, and 59 minutes. We'll look uh, now briefly at some video shot uh, earlier this afternoon, about 1.30, over in the crew quarters. See Michael Lopez Alegria with uh, John Harrington next to him. Then, as we move to the right, Paul Lockhart, our commander, Jim Weatherby, Expedition 6 Mission Specialist Nikolai Bederin, Ken Bowersox, and Don Pettit. And after their snack, they were off for the weather briefing, of course, which was of great interest uh, to all of them today. And uh, then on to the uh, suit-up room. We'll look now at uh, some video taken about uh, 3.30 this afternoon in the uh, astronaut quarters of the suit-up. We see uh, Commander Jim Weatherby being fitted with his helmet. background there is astronaut Charlie Precourt who's flying the uh, weather reconnaissance aircraft today. That's our pilot Paul Lockhart. Expedition 6 crew member Ken Bowersox. Mission Specialist, Expedition 6 crew member Don Pettit, and Nikolai Buderin. Crossing over here to Michael Lopez Alegria. And John Harrington. We go back now to 4 o'clock this afternoon when the seven-member crew left the astronaut quarters. They uh, are here leaving the suit-up room. Steve Hawley, chief astronaut in the uh, brown coat. our pilot, Paul Lockhart, who will join Jim Weatherby in the right front seat of Endeavor. NTD, CDR contract. CDR, this is the NTD. I got, I got you loud and clear. How do you read me, Wex? I'm clear, Steve, and we're ready tonight if the weather is Okay, we're trying to pull one out at the uh, Spanish Tau sites, and uh, we're ready also. Expedition uh, 6 uh, crew member Don Pettit will be sitting in the mid-deck center seat.
Don Pettit now on board Endeavor, being seated in the uh, mid-deck center seat, joining Ken Bauer Sox and Nikolai Buderin. And this is John Harrington, mission specialist number two. And our first Native American in space. On the flight deck now where we can see John Harrington now seated in the aft mid deck uh, or rather aft uh, flight deck center seat. And he was the last crew member to board. So as we heard, the go has been given to go ahead and begin some of the preliminary uh, closeout operations for the uh, the orbiter crew cabin. Call check. MS2, this is NTD. I have you loud and clear. And good afternoon, John, and welcome aboard. And attention all stations, this is the NTD performing the launch status check. Verify you're ready to resume the count and say go, no go for launch. OTC, go. TBC. TBC is go. TTC. TTC, go. LPS. LPS, go. Houston flight. Houston flight is go. Mila. And Mila's go. STM? STM, go. Safety console? Safety console's go. SPE? SPE's go. LRD? LRD, go. SRO? SRO is go. You have range to clear to launch. And CDR? Endeavors, go. I copy. And launch director, entity? Launch director? The launch team is ready to proceed. Copy that. Chief engineer, launch director, verify no constraints to launch. Engineering team is go. Thank you. KSC, safety and mission assurance. Safety and mission assurance is go, Mike. Copy, thank you. ISS launch manager. ISS and payload processing is go, Mike. Good, thank you, Randy. Range weather. Weather has no constraints to launch. Thank you, Kathy. Ops manager. The MMT is go, Mike. Okay, Linda, thank you. Endeavor launch director. Go ahead. Yeah, Wex, well, looks like we got a good vehicle and good weather tonight for you. So have a great flight, and I hope you have a good turkey dinner back for Thanksgiving. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, great job to the folks who processed the vehicle and the payload getting us ready, uh, especially the last couple of weeks. Great job. And so from the Bridge of Endeavor, we're ready to set thundering sail. Great. Thanks for the nice words. Entity, with that, you're clear to launch. Entity copies the countdown clock will resume from T minus nine minutes in three minutes and 20 seconds. Mark. Standing by now to come out of the hold once again in 10 seconds, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, T minus 9 minutes and counting. T minus 9 minutes and counting. Jill's auto sequence has been initiated. Ground launch sequencer now controlling. As you build the station into a reality, you secure a foothold in the cosmos for all mankind. So orbiter test conductor Jeff Lawfer. Thank you. The uh, orbiter axis arm can be moved back into position in about 30 seconds should there be an emergency. T minus seven minutes. NTD LPS 212. Go at LPS. RF glitch. Working sequence 121. 27B. Inhibiting redundant switch on GPCA, OIA, and payload A. Okay. Any holds requested? No hold. No. No LCC. Okay. I copy. Further plan. Further volume 5. SDE. SD copies and concurs. DRPS OTC. Start EP strip chart recorders. DRPS copies. DLP OTC perform APU pre-start. OTC APU pre-start in work. And attention all stations, the countdown will continue. It's unknown condition. Look 
Liquid oxygen tank reported at flight pressure. OTC, caution warning cleared, no unexpected errors. OTC copies and Endeavour OTC, close and lock your visors and initiate O2 flow. Liquid hydrogen tank now being pressurized. T minus 90 seconds. This is a CNN live event. Hello, I'm Marina Colby at the CNN Center. After two delays, the United States Space Agency, NASA, appears ready to launch a shuttle Endeavour. Let's go live to the Kennedy Space Station and uh, see what they're doing as the countdown winds Clock down there. We are hearing activated. the voice of NASA in the background. Final the astronauts have boarded the space shuttle. They're waiting for word on Spanish weather. Stand the astronauts the had climbed aboard the, the space shuttle Endeavour for a second straight evening. NASA is hoping that the clouds in Spain will part long enough to start a repeatedly delayed trip to the International Space seconds. Station. Bad weather at the shuttle emergencies landing sites forced a 24-hour scrub last night. Two hours before launch time tonight, Sounds the space agency has reported a drying trend at one of the landing sites. And as they continue to keep their eye on Spanish 10, weather, let's 9, listen to the 8, voice of NASA. 7, 6, go for main engine start. Off of Space Shuttle Endeavour, another building block for the foundation of the International Space Station. Houston now controlling the flight of Endeavour. Three new residents headed for the International Space Station. Endeavour completing the roll. The shuttle now in a heads down wings level position for the eight and a half minute ride to orbit. Endeavour's three liquid fuel main engines throttling back now in a three-step fashion to 72% of rated performance, reducing the stress on the orbiter as it breaks through the sound barrier. Forty-five seconds into the flight, the main engine soon to begin to rev up to full throttle, 104% of rated performance. The main engines, along with the three fuel cells and three hydraulic power units, all functioning normally. Endeavour Houston, go at throttle up. Go at throttle up. The throttle up call acknowledged by Commander Jim Weatherby. And uh, Endeavour has blasted off. The weather looking good in uh, both uh, Cape Canaveral and in Spain. The space shuttle Endeavour lifted off from Cape Canaveral on a Saturday after nearly a month of delays caused by weather, leaks, cracks, and human error. The shuttle carrying a new crew to the International Space Station left the launch pad at 7.50 p.m. Eastern Time. The on Friday, the countdown was halted less than 10 minutes before liftoff, altitude. but on uh, Saturday, the rain in Zaragoza, Spain, lifted targets. early enough for Endeavour to get away. Endeavour is loaded with $390 million of space station girder, almost identical to one launched last month. Two crew members will hook it up during three space walks. The shuttle also contains minute, valves for the U.S. carbon the dioxide removal unit aboard the station separation. and extra air scrubbing canisters. Both the American and Russian air purifiers have malfunctioned in recent weeks. Endeavour is the ride home for American astronaut Peggy Whitson and Russian cosmonaut Valery Kurzun and also Russian cosmonaut Sergei Treshkev who have been living on the space station since June and Saturday was their 171st day in orbit. They will be replaced by American Kenneth Bauer, Sox and Donald Petit and Russian Nikolai Budarin who will stay for at least four months. And that concludes our coverage. Thanks for joining us. Now we return you to regular programming in progress. This has been a CNN live event. Stand by for the handoff to the onboard computer. Handshake has occurred, T minus 30 seconds and counting. 25 seconds. Firing chain is armed. Sound suppression water system activated. 10 
T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Go for main engine start. of Space Shuttle Endeavour, another building block for the foundation of the International Space Station. Houston now controlling the site of Endeavour, three new residents headed for the International Endeavour completing the roll, the shuttle now in a heads down wings level position for the eight and a half minute ride to orbit. Endeavour's three liquid fuel main engines throttling back now in a three-step fashion to 72% of rated performance, reducing the stress on the orbiter as it breaks through the sound barrier. Forty-five seconds into the flight, the main engine soon to begin to rev up to full throttle, 104% of rated performance. The main engines, along with the three fuel cells and three hydraulic power units, all functioning normally. Endeavour Houston, go at throttle up. Go at throttle up. The throttle up call acknowledged by Commander Jim Weatherby, joined on the flight deck by pilot Paul Lockhart, flight engineer John Harrington, and mission specialist Mike Lopez Alegria. The Expedition 6 crew, Ken Bowersox, Nikolai Budarin, and Don Pettit, seated down on the mid deck, headed for their new home in space. One minute, 22 seconds into the flight of Endeavour. The orbiter already 10 miles downrange, 13 miles in altitude, shedding its weight as it heads toward main engine cutoff targets. All of Endeavour systems in good shape, one minute, 50 seconds into the flight as we stand by for solid rocket booster separation. Booster officer confirms a good solid rocket booster separation. Guidance now converging. Endeavour's onboard computers commanding the main engine nozzles to gently swivel, aiming the shuttle for a precise target in space. Now traveling at a speed of about four miles per second. The booster officer reports that all three main engines throttling back now uh, in a normal fashion to reduce the stress uh, on the crew members to that of three times the effect of gravity. Endeavour now almost 700 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. Booster officer reports main engine cutoff confirmed. A perfect ascent for Endeavour. Standing by for external tank separation. Endeavour Houston, nominal Miko, Ohms 1 not required, you are go for plus X. It's been a frustrating two weeks for the U.S. Space Agency, NASA. Mechanical problems and unfavorable weather conditions kept the shuttle Endeavour on the launch pad, well beyond its scheduled liftoff date. But now the history-making mission is finally underway. Miles O'Brien reports. The 16th shuttle launch to the International Space Station was sweet indeed. Two hours after sunset, the rocket's white glare lit up the night sky. Endeavour is carrying the six three-member crew that will live aboard the station. Welcome relief for the current crew. For the past five months, they have lived together in a giant tinker toy the size of an 1,800-square-foot house with few of the comforts of home. Take the food, for example, hermetically sealed and dehydrated. After a couple of months, I was, I was pretty bored with the food. There's still some things that are appealing to me, but for the most part, I go eat so that I can talk to Valeria and Sergey. It's not because there's really that much interesting that, I'm, uh, that I want to eat. The incoming commander, Ken Bowersox, is a NASA astronaut and Navy captain. Uh, I'm not really sure what that's going to be like. I've been uh, at sea for four months before uh, with 5,000 other guys in an aircraft carrier, but I've never been with three guys in one spot for that long. 
Uh, and I've been told by other people who are up there that it actually is a bigger factor than they thought um, to be with the same people day after day after day. The shuttle is also carrying a big piece of hardware, a 23,000 pound piece of the truss that will be the backbone of the orbiting science lab. The crews will install it using the station and shuttle robot arms and a pair of spacewalking astronauts. One of them, John Harrington, will get an astounding ride at the end of a robot arm as he totes a piece of hardware from one side of the station to the other. Oh, that's going to be that's going to be a blast. Um, I didn't realize until I got into the virtual reality lab uh, how amazing this was going to be. As I get pitched around, I'm going to have a chance to see some just uh, awesome science. John Harrington became the first Native American to feel the awesome power of a space launch on this night. It is a launch that was delayed by a series of mechanical and weather problems. For the crew on the International Space Station, Endeavor will come knocking not a moment too soon. Miles O'Brien, CNN, at the Kennedy Space Center, Florida. And I'm Arnold Naidu. The news continues here on CNN. Mehr als zwei Wochen musste die Besatzung der US-Raumfähre Endeavour auf einen Start warten, wegen technischer Probleme und schlechten Wetters. Vergangene Nacht dann war es soweit. Von Cape Canaveral in Florida hob das Shuttle ab, unterwegs zur internationalen Raumstation ISS. An Bord Bauteile für das Außengerüst der Station und die neue dreiköpfige Langzeitbesatzung. Bereits am Dienstag sollen die ersten Außenarbeiten im All beginnen. Good evening. Welcome to our STS-113 post-launch news conference with NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe. The Administrator has some opening comments and then we'll take your questions. Well, good evening. It was a uh, very, very successful launch and one that uh, long awaited. Certainly great anticipated uh, and all the efforts that went into uh, assuring this third attempt was done uh, safely and done in a way that uh, I think we're all very, very proud of the diligence that the Uh, the launch team here at Kennedy Space Center demonstrates every single day to assure a successful launch. The second attempt was last night, as many of you, I'm sure all of you, recall, and several of your colleagues that might have been here last night and the time before aren't here today, so I congratulate you for your persistence and uh, diligence in covering this as well. I was here yesterday, and uh, after the scrub was announced, uh, about five minutes before the launch window was due to open, Uh, by Mike Lombard. Um There was somebody I encountered in the stands as I walked out that said, boy, eventually these folks are going to get this right. And my response was, yes, that's exactly what they did today. They got it exactly right. If everything isn't exactly right for one of these launch efforts, we ought to really stop and wonder whether or not we're going to proceed ahead. And the ethos that we see in culture of this agency that stops unless everything is exactly the way it should be is precisely the attitude we seek to encourage every single day. We make no apologies for that. And in fact, I think that's precisely the view that we expect of all of the folks associated with it. And, it's, and the thing I am most proud of, of what we do in this agency, is everyone comes to that view naturally. It's not because anyone tells them to. And that's impressive, and it's something I find to be most encouraging. So in that regard, um, uh, the folks that are probably most relieved today that the launch occurred not only safely, but uh, as uh, we had planned here this evening, uh, certainly the crew of the Expedition 5 is delighted to hear that uh, folks are on the way. Uh, and uh, without a doubt, there's going to be uh, an opportunity, I think, for Peggy Whitson to restore her SALTSA requirements, uh, not only on uh, the balance of this flight, but also upon her return on or about December 4th, assuming uh, the weather is exactly right and everything's conditions are in good shape uh, for the crew to return on that date on the return trip for Expedition 113. Uh, an outstanding crew that's on its way to relieve uh, she and uh, Larry Corzun and Sergei Treskiff. Um, we're looking forward to uh, great accomplishments from Expedition 6 uh, that rival that of Expedition 5, I'm sure. But Ken Bowersox and Don Pettit and Nikolai Buderin, I'm sure, will do an exceptional job uh, as their predecessors did as well. So we are, are uh, just delighted to see this uh, 
uh, crew return uh, mission launched successfully, safely, and in a way that uh, guarantees that we'll soon be seeing Expedition 5 coming home uh, in uh, the continuation of the construction of uh, the International Space Station with the, the uh, assemblage uh, of the uh, starboard truss there as a, as a consequence of the cargo effort that's now been certified to be uh, useful for that particular effort as well. So during the course of these next few days, we'll see that continuing expansion move on to get us towards that core configuration so we can look at the full potential of station as we go down the road here. So again, thank you all for your persistence and willingness to uh, stick it out with all of us as we do our jobs to assure this is done well. Hey, questions? Yes, sir. Hello, Hi, Craig Tavault with Aviation Week. Um, Roughly, you've been administrator now for about a year. Uh, how would uh, you say NASA is different now than it was when you came in? Kind of give a, a, a retrospective on the last year. And don't just combine it to uh, shuttle and, and station, but planning for the long haul financial health. Wow. Um. Let me respond to that in five seconds or less uh, by just telling you that, that I think that what I find positively stunning over the course of this year is the energy level, the enthusiasm that I see in this agency every single day is certainly no different than the day I walked in it. And it's a reminder that it isn't about any individual and what goes on during the course of that time. It's collectively what we can all do together collaboratively. And I think the achievements, successes that we've seen over the course of this year are testimonial to that. Uh, we certainly have plenty of challenges, but they're ones that I think are defined in a way that, that uh, just as a consequence of, of uh, for example, the, the amendment that was submitted by the President last week to the fiscal year 03 budget very clearly speaks to the selectivity, the choice, and the, and the very clear focus that we're attempting to bring to, for example, in that case, the uh, Integrated Space Transportation Plan and Station. But across the board, I think what you'll find is an equal level of uh, concentration and intensity of focus uh, as we move ahead for next year's plan that will be out in about three months as well. So we've been working on that pretty hard in the course of that time. But that's, again, no different than what existed before my time and uh, very much a byproduct, I think, of the energy and enthusiasm. It's just a natural byproduct of the folks that are part of this agency that all of us share uh, for the objectives of space exploration. It's marvelous. Uh, can you uh, <laughs> just take a moment on the financial uh, health of the agency as you look at it now compared to when you came in? Uh, I think, it's, I think we're, we're, we're getting there. We've got a, we've got a couple of things we, we really need to concentrate on, and we're moving on Britain uh, very uh, expeditiously. Uh, first is to, to implement a core financial system, which is underway. Uh, by June, every one of the centers and headquarters throughout the agency will be on the same financial system. And that's the uh, first time in 44 years of the agency's history. And it's not a big... Uh, you know, accomplishment in that sense is just basic fundamental financial management kind of stuff. Uh, two of the ten centers are on it right now on that system, and each will be progressively brought in uh, over the course of uh, the next several months and by June of 03, everybody will be in the same common system. So that's, that's a major, uh, I think, move in that direction uh, just to get back to basics and the fundamentals of how you get the house in order. And what it means, I think, uh, is the opportunity to get real-time information uh, of uh, not just financial stuff. This is not just about accountancy. It's about the, the you know, management information system. It will be 24 hours old instead of a full quarter old, which is kind of where we are right now. If I wanted to know the actuals on anything, it would take me, the best I could do is see the information that's 60 to 90 days old. So it is a, a step in that direction. The second feature, I think, that goes with that, too, is that uh, the cost estimating efforts we're using for development of the financial systems and the budget itself, I think, will be uh, very much in evidence when you see the, the next year's plan uh, put forward as well. So I think that's moving in the right direction, too. Thank you for the question. Yes, sir? <coughs> oh, that's good. Why can't we by the mic? Okay. Mike Cabbage with the Orlando Sentinel. Uh, speaking of the ISTP, I realize it's it's early, but could you talk a bit about the um, 
the requirements, big picture you're looking at for an orbital space plane, like um, preferred uh, crew size capabilities. Um, who and where is, is forming these requirements, and when do you expect to have some pretty much set in stone that you can get to industry? Well, uh, <clears throat> first of all, I think the origins of, of so much of what we see now as a consequence of coming forward with the idea of an orbital space plane in the Integrated Space Transportation Plan is a direct byproduct of the efforts that have been underway now for the last couple, three years through the Space Launch Initiative to narrow down and to focus at this particular juncture was the plan to select where we were going to go with an, an RLV reusable launch vehicle capacity. And this particular capability uh, was one of the, the, the capabilities called out, I guess, through the SLI efforts over the court. And, and the job, I think, that the team has done in helping us frame that set of decisions helped us get to that point. So in many ways, the, uh, the fundamental, the basic kind of top-level requirements <coughs> excuse me, have been identified. Uh, and, and what you see in, in, the, in the description in the the President's Budget Amendment and the Integrated Space Transportation Plan, as it's now described, in looking at this entire system of how we support the efforts we're engaged in uh, for uh, space station and elsewhere, it defines, I think, a very specific requirement for crew transfer vehicle, crew return capacity uh, that is the option we select to be going in what is orbital space plan. Over the next 18 months, I think that design parameter will be really crisply uh, work through certainly by this January, I think what's referred to as the level one requirements, which kind of gives you a greater level of specificity of what the, the basic um, operational demands of the asset should be. But over the next 18 months, those design parameters will be worked out very clearly and will certainly uh, be uh, um, uh, soliciting uh, a strong degree of, uh, of, of involvement, cooperation, and interest in the part of the industry. Uh, to assure that we get the best possible design parameters we can to develop and ultimately operate uh, that asset uh, with, uh, I think, with the ultimate objective of trying to do that by the end of this decade. So I think that'd be a major accomplishment in and of itself. Yes, sir. Mr. O'Keefe, Jay Barbary with NBC. Um, we've been reading a lot of details and reports about your new space initiative. Do you have any indi indications or promises from the Bush administration, the incoming uh, Republican Congress, the Senate and the House, that they will support you in this? Well, I think that the fact that the President of the United States signed the budget amendment is a testimonial statement in and of itself that, that the administration supports it. He personally, Vice President, and uh, certainly throughout the administration, this is our plan. Uh, and we are proceeding ahead with that approach. Uh, the Congress, I believe, from the testimonials that I've, I've managed to read in the mighty fine publications represented here, uh, have at least indicated they are willing to consider it carefully. Others have expressed a very strong support for it. Uh, I think is, overall, I think the, the general enthusiasm is fairly high in moving ahead in that direction. The important thing to remember, I think, in this case, is uh, this was um, a plan that was developed as we worked through our objectives to be launched as part of the fiscal year 04 initiatives, for example. And rather than wait until February of 2003 for delivery of the President's budget for 04, uh, I think the administration, the President, uh, had a significant, uh, uh, you know, I think, sense of confidence that the credibility of the agency being fully behind this effort and have it, having it thought out augured in favor of delivering this early and making it available in November uh, of this year. Certainly, one of the understanding was the Congress would not act on it now because they were on their way out of town. But at least it gives an opportunity for everybody to kind of work through it, think about it. And uh, as soon as the Congress returns uh, for the next session of Congress and their attempts to move on expeditiously in the 03 budget process, we have an opportunity to get on with this expeditiously as opposed to waiting for another year. So that's the strongest testimonial I could possibly have asked for, an endorsement from uh, the administration, from the president himself. Uh, and indeed, uh, I think it's a testimony that we're moving in a direction that uh, you know, we're pretty confident uh, of, its, of its results as we move along. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Peter King, CBS News Radio. Mr. O'Keefe, I'm just wondering, well, I want to go back to the orbital space plane for a second. I'm wondering if, if you see that as a potential non-cargo carrying replacement for the shuttle, and perhaps would uh, future space station plans include the OSP and uh, heavy lifter rockets such as the Delta IV that we saw fly for the first time uh, this past week, uh, taking the place of the shuttle down the line? Mm -hmm. You bet. No, thanks for the question. Um, there's no, no doubt that the, the, the primary focus, as we've articulated in the initial documents sent over as part of the Integrated Space Transportation Plan to support the orbital space plane proposal, it is predominantly a crew transfer, crew return capability that we seek. Uh, and my anticipation, I think, as we work through this from what all of our, I think, our experts throughout the, the agency looking at this from the space flight standpoint, uh, of what the cargo capacity requirements are and heavy lift capability, we just saw it perform tonight brilliantly. That's a tremendous uh, asset for that kind of capability. Its, it's limitation, to the extent that there are any you can really describe, is that it is not a, an extensively maneuverable asset. It's not one that easily can launch on even near demand. There's a lot of preparation work that's got to go into doing this. And so as a result, we want to encourage that diligence, never have anybody cut a quarter on that, but in the process make available through the orbital space plane, I think, a capability that would be closer to a, again, a crew transfer and return capacity that would uh, assure the kind of um, uh, requirements, for example, on the International Space Station, here we are transitioning now more towards the science and engineering, excuse me, science and research objectives of station as opposed to the engineering objectives of building it. That then means there are periods in the research objective where uh, I think there, the, the, the surge of crew demand time for actual uh, working on uh, the research and science objectives gives us the capacity to do that with a crew transfer vehicle that, that OSP represents. And so that is a very dominant focus that we're looking at, I think, throughout the, you know, the space flight uh, community as a means to really make available a capability for uh, the crew return uh, and, and transfer capabilities that are necessary. Quick follow-up, and I know you may be reluctant to do this because you remember back in the beginning uh, when they were designing the shuttle, they said dozens of flights a year, and it hasn't come close to that. But, I mean, uh, how, how much on demand do you want to see uh, this uh, OSP be available? Uh, Ten times a year, 20 times a year? Uh, I think, well, well, better than what we're experiencing now. Let's put it that way. I mean, it, it, it takes, um, uh, you know, the, a shuttle uh, orbiter will sit on the launch pad for, on average, 27, 28 days uh, at, after movement from the VAB to that condition and the cargo load and I mean, everything's got to work out exactly right. Um, this, the, the orbiter Endeavor sat on the pad for the fat end of you know, almost six weeks as a consequence of weather and oxygen line and, you know, uh, the weather in Spain. Uh, I mean, you know, you name it, anything could get in the way of this. And it should, and that's why everybody around here is laser-like focused on making sure you never do that without everything being exactly the way it ought to be. Now that's a lot of parameters and, and strictures that have to be met and should be in order to lift that kind of, of capacity and the people that are engaged in it. Now, if we can move ourselves to the point where there's an asset that then also can give us, a again, a, a more... Uh, maneuverable and flexible uh, uh, capability for crew transfer requirements that the OSP represents uh, as a potential, then I think we've accomplished a, an effort that uh, really gives us some versatility in that process in addition to a really remarkable workhorse heavy lift asset that the shuttle represents. And again, part of the amendment, part of the Integrated Space Transportation Plan is to extend the service life of that asset because it really is in great shape. One of the great things we've learned, I guess, by uh, the fuel line cracks and everything else that have been worked on here in the last several months is working over every detail of these orbiters, they're in pretty decent shape. And these are in, in fantastic condition uh, and not that, you know, stressed. This is the 19th flight of Endeavor. That's an asset that's 10 years old, 
And when you think about it, that's a fraction of the time uh, that it, it, uh, of the age of the average aircraft that dropped a lot of ordnance in Afghanistan just a few months ago or a year ago, okay? I mean, like a quarter of the age. The oldest orbiter we got is half the age of every one of those airplanes that dropped a lot of stuff in Afghanistan and we never sweat a minute about, right? Uh, yeah, right. So as a consequence, I mean, these are in marvelous condition. And uh, the, the, we learned a lot about the material condition of these assets and the fact that the, the stress on them is something we've got to always be mindful of. We've got to make absolutely certain we understand the, you know, the consequences of every single launch and treat them like we do as unique experiences. But at the same time, what we've learned about them, I think, in, in recent months is the opportunity, I think, to really look at a life extension program and operate them well into the next decade is not out of the realm of possibility for the cargo heavy lift capability. It's its versatility we really need to, to enhance by the crew transfer capabilities that OSP could provide for us. Yes, sir. Uh, Stefano Colodan for the New York Times and Patro Mechanics. And Mr. O'Keefe, uh, looking further into the future, um, I was thinking especially what can we expect in terms of nuclear propulsion? When are we going to have some sort of firm commitment in that regard, like especially missions and spacecraft? Yes, sir. Thank you very much for the question. Um, as as I'm, I'm sure you're, you're aware by virtue of the, the, uh, uh, the informed nature of the question, we have proceeded ahead as part of the President's fiscal year 03 proposal uh, that he made last February and that both the House and Senate in the respective committee uh, positions have agreed to uh, the initiation of a nuclear uh, propulsion and nuclear systems initiative that we are working on for power generation and propulsion capabilities that uh, we set as an objective to improve by about a factor of three the power generation and propulsion capacities for um, spacecraft uh, that uh, would be for deep space exploration objectives and other purposes. I mean, we could look for down the road, I think, in a lot of different applications. Struck by, I think, over the course of this past year, the support that we've garnered for that. There has been a very strong, uh, I think, position from the Congress uh, that that is not only an acceptable approach to things, but they are, uh, I think, have endorsed it. The approach there is, I think, a continuing effort we're working on right now, having initiated that effort now just a, a few weeks ago to get the Nuclear Systems Initiative underway, uh, that really, I think, is going to significantly enhance our capacity to do any exploration. I mean, as it stands right now, uh, to go to the edge of this solar system, if we were to start a, a, uh, an effort here in the next uh, few years, two to three, uh, by the end of the next decade, the space probe might get there. And it would get there in time to really inform the scientific agenda to the tune of maybe six to eight weeks more definitively than if we had used any earthbound or uh, telescope-based uh, asset Hubble or something else uh, in that time. So that's a, that's a real tough uh, sell to, to think in terms of what our current technology and technical capacities uh, really provide right now in terms of the constraints are that you got to wait a lot of years and you got to what you get back you know, from the scientific objectives are pretty narrow. So what we're really looking to do, having seen that, is is uh, got a, a very strong technology objective underway. And for the fiscal year 04 approach, we are looking to significantly enhance enhance that effort. Uh, and so stay tuned. We're looking at some very specific mission objectives and applications that I think will be uh, aggressively explored uh, as we uh, work our way through the February 03 uh, budget position for the fiscal year 04 approach to it. If we're looking to demonstrate that capacity and move on, because it really is a very exciting opportunity, I think, to significantly enhance the science and research uh, opportunities therein. Bill Chen? Let's go back track down to this mission. Um, John Harrington was selected as NASA because he's uh, Navy test pilot, but he's also one of Chickasaw. Any thoughts about uh, how uh, 
uh, this mission and his flight has attracted interest in uh, the, the Native American population, especially okay. Houston, maybe getting interested in science. And did you have any, uh, I know that m most of the Chickasaws had to go back home, but did you have anybody uh, in the delegation, either the congressman or anybody else like that uh, from that community? Mm -hmm. No, thank you for, for the question. Uh, we are very, very proud of John. He's a, he's a remarkable guy. And again, I, uh, my bias uh, for him always is by virtue of my formal uh, uh, naval personage uh, standing. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely supportive. I was, I was at the uh, at the launch site with uh, Mike Foreman, uh, who is also a Naval Academy grad, and at the uh, conclusion of the singing of the Nan national anthem, we both. Uh, just on cue and just as a prospect of training said, go Navy. <laughs> so it's part of the uh, beat Army, you know, you got to do anything. But it's, a, uh, uh, it's really remarkable to get a guy uh, of his background and uh, capability and certainly the excitement that he has generated in his very quiet way, uh, just by his competence and by his uh, extraordinary uh, diligence in what he does and how well he does it. Uh, is motivated within the Native American community, I think, is really quite impressive. And you're right on the on the original announced to launch effort on the first attempt that we made. Uh, there was a tremendous contingent here from the Chickasaw Nation, as well as so many other Native Americans who were part of it. I met the governor and lieutenant governor of the Chickasaw Nation, and uh, just most ex excited uh, and, and delighted by the whole opportunity, I think, to see uh, the chance for a, a member of their uh, nation and interest in uh, the continuing support for Native Americans uh, pursuing this kind of, of set of opportunities and realizing as well within reach by virtue of just, you know, again, the quiet pursuit of the, uh, the confidence that John demonstrates every day, Captain Harrington demonstrates every day. Is, uh, was an opportunity I think they really, really accented to me several times when I talked to them and said this is a, a role model that uh, will be viewed in that regard. And as far as uh, current members who are here, yes, a uh, well, member of my staff, uh, Ruth Wewell, is here. She is a uh, Mohawk and uh, is very uh, excited by the, the historic demonstration of the Native American uh, community. Uh, in seeing John Harrington's flight. So I'm most appreciative of the question. Thank you. Dan Billow. Hi, Dan Billow with West TV. I'd like to ask you a little bit about yourself. Um, you came in here a year ago with guns blazing and the X-38 went away and uh, shuttle flights to the space station went down to four a year and the crew size of the space station uh, was uh, going to be limited to three for at least the foreseeable future. And now a year later, the X-38 is back and better than ever as the orbital space plane. Uh, investing in the space shuttle, going up to five flights a year. Uh, crew size of the shuttle, you're looking for way, or of the uh, station, you're looking for ways to increase there and get, get more habitation facilities up there. So uh, what has happened? Have you changed your mind on some of these things? Have you gotten religion? Uh, what's going on? I've had an epiphany, yes, that's right. Uh, no, I think it, it, is, it is a case where um, my, I think the characterization you just, you just laid out here is just a little different than what I would do, but I'd be happy to explore that at whatever length you prefer in another time. But suffice to say that I think what, what, what's really significant over the course of the last 18 months is laying out uh, a very concerted uh, engineering plan that comports with the challenge of the systems integration effort that goes into International Space Station uh, has been accomplished. You know, I think Bill Gerstenmeyer, the program manager for International Space Station, has done a positively stunning job of thinking like an engineer and focusing on this to assure that the systems integration effort is complete at the processing of all that work through here at Kennedy. Uh, Space Center matches up with that sequence that Ron Didamore, the project uh, manager for the shuttle program, has the capacity and operational wherewithal to support it. And we have gone through an extended effort over the course of the past year to assure that what drives this sequence is the systems integration effort, the most optimum engineering approach that we could possibly come up with. So the flight rate, all of that, is driven by that, not by some artificial constriction. And I think that was not the case a couple of years ago. Uh, and and in, in, in part because the sequence of what was the approach 
therein, I think, was driven by lots of other factors. And again, a set of imperatives that was, in all fairness, driven by a very short period of time uh, in which we occupied the station. We are just now, we are just now finishing the second year of permanent presence in space. So we're really new to this. And so as a consequence, a lot of the effort that's gone on over the course of the past year was an att attempt to try to constantly size this properly and have the systems integration uh, effort that uh, the project management team has worked out really drive what that sequence would be, what the launch rate would be. And ultimately, ultimately, and here's the real punchline, have the entire program be driven by what science and research objectives you want as opposed to any other set of variables. There are a lot of other factors that go into it that are consequent or consent or, uh, or uh, an impact of it. But to really look at the science and research objectives and to look at those priorities and establish for what this is an amazing capability that cannot be duplicated here on Earth. Try as we might, we have never been able to do this over a sustained period of time to duplicate the, the condition of microgravity that persists every single day on the International Space Station on Earth. It can't be done. We haven't been able to be successful at it so far. Maybe it can be done, but it hasn't, it hasn't worked so far. And in that regard, how do we utilize that capability? How do we design uh, the science and research priorities and, and utilization effort in order to maximize our yield of the science that comes from that and the breakthrough opportunities that could come? That's what's really focusing our attention today. So. Um, yeah, my flip comment at the beginning of I've had an epiphany. No, you know, the reality is I think this whole approach has been now sequenced to look at uh, the systems integration effort that's necessary, which is really what we do at NASA really well. We have a great history and tradition of doing so, and yielding from that a capability that that uh, is more. Uh, extensive than uh, any of that because it's driven by the science and research requirements. We are building the equivalent of a pyramid in space at this point. And we, get, we can't lose sight of that. I mean, it really is that spectacular. This is one of the, the wonders of the, of the world kind of capabilities. And in doing so, that really takes an awful lot of uh, discipline to make that happen and all the diligence you see demonstrated even here uh, this evening with this launch. I think that's a, a testimonial to it. And we have time for one final question, Mark Carreau. Uh, thanks, uh, Mark Carreau from the Houston Chronicle. And Hi, Mark. Hi. I was looking uh, back with you over the past year. You've tackled some pretty difficult problems with the station and uh, financial management throughout the agency and then finishing uh, or completing a, a space transportation plan. What I wondered is if there's a second tier of priorities you're going to tackle uh, in the coming year and if you can give us a sense of what, what those are. Well, uh, I appreciate the, the, uh, the summary of um, what I think the focus has been here over the course of the past year, but I, I would uh, put an even, even uh, different emphasis to the fact that uh, basically what we've been doing is really focusing on the fundamentals, you know, dealing with some of the basic issues that are necessary for um, the, the management of an agency as exotic <laughs> as what NASA is and, and the things that we do in the research and development community and operating the very unique systems that we have charge for. Uh, and so really that's what this has been all about, is looking at what are the fundamentals in order to do that properly and to really get back to the real uh, foundation of, of what it is we do uh, as, a, as a primary order. Beyond that, I think the, the point that we're also seeking to emphasize is let's also rediscover, reinvigorate that which motivated the founding of this agency 44 years ago which was the demand for entrepreneurship, a different way of looking at, at problems, looking at technical challenges and conquering them. In so many ways, the Nuclear Systems Initiative is part of that get back to basics of let's look at the, the entrepreneurial beat those technical challenge problems. We've been living with this persistent issue of limitation on speed for space exploration for the entire 44 years of this agency. 
We fly at precisely the same speeds in low Earth orbit today that we did when the agency was founded. The guys are up there right now doing their thing, flying at precisely those same speeds as the predecessor of you know, Apollo programs did, uh, you know, Gemini, Mercury, everything we've done is all on that line. We, this is the first real opportunity to focus on beating that technical limitation. How do you get past that through power generation and propulsion capabilities? The second major thing I think that we've really got to concentrate to as well, if we want to go anywhere to really explore space in the way that, again, was part of what the agency was founded for, is we've got to really understand and the consequences and be able to mitigate against the deficiencies of human endurance and the challenges that there are to that. And over the course of the past two years, that's it. That's the maximum period of time we've had at long duration spaceflight as Americans. The Russians certainly have a, a stronger uh, track record in terms of duration time than we do, but not a whole lot. And so really, as humans, we are just really at the very front end of understanding what the consequences are on people for long duration space flight. And the maximum period of time that we've already hit as Americans is now 196 days, Dan Bursch and Carl Waltz holding that record. That's less than the amount of time that it takes to get to one of the most favorite destinations people identify all the time. Now, we believe in, in round trips at NASA. It's a very big thing. It's critical. It is essential. It's one of the basic ingredients. And so we really got to know what the entire effect is on people before we really get launched you know, on going to, to things that are beyond the scope of that. So I'd say getting back to the basics, the fundamentals of what we were after to really you know, to look at the, at the, the, the fundamental uh, issues and the, and the basic issues of management of the agency is what has dominated so much time recently. But much of what we've also been dealing with, and I think we need to heighten and really emphasize a lot, and we touched on a little bit earlier this evening, is to also rediscover and reinvigorate that concentration on the entrepreneurial focus of what this agency has always been about, which is to conquer those limitations that exist and persist in order to achieve exploration opportunities beyond that. And you name the destination, that's where we really ought to be positioning ourselves to go and be able to go to once the conditions present themselves uh, to suggest that we ought to be uh, in pursuit of those objectives. We have to have the wherewithal to do it, and we have to meet every one of those technical obstacles and position ourselves to be sure we can do it, and that's what I think we've been concentrating on and will really be heightened in the time ahead. So thank you all very much. I look forward to uh, hearing uh, Mike Weinbach's uh, uh, discussion too as well. He's coming shortly uh, to describe the very successful efforts that uh, our expert launch team here at Kennedy Space Center uh, conducted. And again, I cannot tell you how proud we all are in this agency of the, the professionalism and the diligence that's demonstrated here every single time we launch. And again, we're, we're so pleased with uh, the approach that uh, I think we all are here to in this agency to assure that it's done safely every single time. You've learned that lesson well. Thank you all for your, your time. And again, persistence is sticking with us as we uh, have made this one work. Good evening, everyone. This is the post-launch press conference for STS-113. And here with us to discuss how the countdown went tonight is Jim Halsell, the manager of Space Shuttle Program Launch Integration, and Mike Leinbach, the Space Shuttle Launch Director. We'll begin first with Jim Halsell. Jim? Thank you, George, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It was just a spectacular night, uh, weather-wise and, and launch-wise. The, uh, the vehicle was uh, completely healthy. I'm sure Mike had a couple of uh, small issues he, he was working, but at the program level, uh, we were basically uh, disengaged the whole time. And uh, even more importantly uh, for, for this launch, uh, the towel weather cooperated uh, today, and uh, we were able to get off the ground with no problems. Uh, it's, it's too soon, of course, to even begin to declare the mission a success, but uh, it's not too soon to start thinking about uh, the meaning of what this year has meant to uh, uh, the shuttle program and, uh, and our, our primary customer, the International Space Station. Um, hopefully this flight is going to go as well as all the ones before it, and uh, like I said, this year is going to go down in history. It's one that we're all proud to be a part of. Right? 
Well, I'll tell you, this one feels good. Uh, after the last couple of weeks working the, uh, the problems on the orbiter, and, and uh, I'm just really, really proud of the launch team and the processing team here at the Kennedy Space Center. Worked so many hours getting the vehicle ready for Jim Weatherby and his crew. It was a beautiful day to, to fly, and, and as Jim said, I'm sure I'm glad the towel weather worked out for us tonight. And uh, it was just just feels good to get this one behind us. It, it, uh, we were in, essentially in launch countdown for almost two weeks. And uh, whenever you do something like that, it just feels good to reward the team with a beautiful launch, and that's what we did tonight. All right, we'll take questions now. Please give your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. We'll start here in the front. Chris? Hi, Chris Freidler from Florida today. I wondered, um, once you finally decided that the sites in Spain were okay, if there was any little wiggle room at all where you said, well, it's pretty darn good, let's do it, or was it, was it uh, pure good weather over there for the launch? Uh, the weather uh, coordinator sits uh, next to myself, and I should mention that uh, Linda Hamm, the program integration manager, was, uh, was serving as the mission uh, management team chair in kind of a, uh, a job training role and cross-training role today. Uh, but I got to, to sit behind her, and, and the weather coordinator was working with her uh, throughout the launch, and there really was no question at any point in time that the weather was currently good. We didn't have to allow enough time to elapse and get close enough to launch time uh, so that the weather forecaster was comfortable in extending his forecast to include the possible landing time uh, at the tile site. Uh, but that happened fairly early in the count, at least historically from my perspective. Uh, it was sometime during the T-minus nine-minute hold, um, more than half an hour prior to launch. Uh, so my gauge of how confident the weather people are and how good the weather is is how soon they're willing to release that go forecast. And that happened fairly early in this count, uh, telling me that uh, the weather was a, a very confident go today. And uh, for Mr. Lambach, were there any little glitches tonight? And did the hold down post nuts uh, explode as expected? I'm uh, very happy to report the hold down post worked perfectly fine this time. Yeah, we, the team that investigated that problem put in a lot of hours too, and in fact, they got the uh, they got the Flow Award after launch tonight, which is the the highest award that that uh, the launch team gives out, and we re we awarded it to three fellows that that represent uh, a, a very very large team that that came to grips with that problem, and made Endeavor safe to fly tonight, so that worked perfectly fine. Um, the only issue we worked, we had a, a an internal leak and a hydraulic system for the orbiter access arm and the, and the Gox vent arm, the beanie cap. Uh, it was an internal leak and it, and it kind of replenishes itself, so it was, that was really never an issue. We did send the red crew out to the pad to see if uh, we saw any external leakage, which there was none. So that one resolved itself very quickly. And that was the only thing we worked. It was a very, very clean countdown. Stefano? Yeah, Stefano Coldman for the New York Times and Popular Mechanics. Um, as far as the ohms ball, bell that uh, uh, sounded like wasn't working uh, a full throttle, uh, how much of a problem is that, and what is the minimum requirement you have for that? Uh, the report we got on console was that uh, after ascent, uh, uh, we, we do a, a, a performance enhancing burn through those engines during ascent. At the completion of that uh, burn, instead of both of the bipropellant valves on the right engine showing closed, one showed closed and one continued to show open. Um, the concern would be, uh, is that a true indication of the bipropellant valve's position or is that a false indication? And they're working that issue at the current time in mission control. But in the meantime, we make the conservative assumption that it is a true indication that valve is open Therefore, we, we are concerned once again with what's the next worst thing that could happen. The next worst thing that could happen is that you would have a similar failure on the other redundant valve, uh, thus allowing the, uh, the engine uh, to continue to burn past the time that you wanted it to, in fact, to depletion. So to prevent any possibility of that happening, uh, the flight rules say that you will not use that engine unless it is needed for a high priority purpose until you get to that most high priority of all burns, which is a deorbit burn to come home. Uh, so they made the OMS 2 circulation burn um, approximately 40 minutes after launch on the left engine only per the flight rules, and it worked perfectly fine. Um, 
and uh, Mission Control will continue to work the issue of whether or not this is a true indication or if they have any rationale that it, uh, it's an indicator problem only. It will have no impact upon the ability to complete the full mission with full success and that we have full access to all the propellants from both sides, left and right, to burn through that left engine. We also have the capability, uh, the redundancy in our reaction control system uh, plus X jets to give us another mechanism to either speed up or slow down to affect the line of those. So we have another level of redundancy in terms of engines. Um, so they're go for the entire mission without any impact. And when it's time to come back, are you going to use uh, both engines? Um, I don't know. I'll have to wait and see. I'm sure this will be an issue for the mission management team uh, uh, to work during the flight as more data comes in. And to be honest with you, I don't uh, have the flight rule memorized with regard to whether you will. I know we would prefer to save the engine for the DR to burn. I can't remember right now if that means we will use that engine. Uh, but we'll be working that as the mission goes on. Yep. Tell us your nerd news. Uh, do you know if, if it's uh, the MMH or NTO side? And uh, on the, the previous Endeavour flow, there was an issue on the left ohms with uh, the pressure regulator, which we replaced. And I think you went through this entire discussion about the flight rules. Uh, different, different problems, same, same flight rules apply. And I assume it's completely unrelated uh, with this one, just given the fact it was in the other engine. Yeah, my first, uh, my first answer is no. I don't know which of the two propellants we're, uh, we're talking about here. Um, the, um, and I'm sorry, the second question had to do if it was related at all to the nitrogen valve. And, and no, there's no, no reason whatsoever at this time to believe that it is, and there was no discussion along those lines um, before I hung up my headset and walked over here. And as far as the tail situation is concerned, I realized that Bangor was closed uh, both uh, for cost and for uh, security reasons. And any thoughts about the fact that uh, Zaragoza and Moron are so relatively close to each other that they're often uh, trapped within the same weather system and it might make sense to have another um, a, a, a different uh, tail site somewhere in Europe for the high inclination missions, uh, which might uh, avoid uh, being under, under the same weather path? Uh, certainly, uh, we have three TAL sites as a program right now. Uh, for any given mission, uh, we have a current uh, program directive that says, hey, pick your best two sites. Uh, we try to do that 30 to 45 days prior to launch. And we take a number of issues and considerations into account, weather certainly being one of them. Um, the decision for this flight was to go with the two Spanish sites. Um, I think in the near-term future, we're going to continue to go through that process and pick our, pick our best two sites, uh, given all the considerations uh, uh, that we need to take uh, into account. Uh, I, I know that as a program, uh, we will continue to look and continue, as we have in the past, looking at what's the best way to optimize our TAL flight rules, our TAL launch constraints, uh, weather and otherwise. And that also includes looking at TAL locations to see if there's any other better, more optimum combination that we might get toward achieving that, uh, that goal of maximizing launch probability, which is what we're really paid to kind of look at. So I guess my answer is certainly all of the above is under consideration, um, but the program currently has three good TAL sites from which to choose, and that's what we'll go with for the time being. Mark? Uh, Mark Carruth from Houston Chronicle. I guess I'm really following on that question. Is, is Ben Guerrero one of those three, and does it stay in the mix for the foreseeable future, even with uh, some of the different uh, uh, criteria you mentioned, including security? Yes, Ben Guerrero is an important town site to us, as important as the other two. It continues to be a full up and supported site. It is a uh, the menu, it's on the menu of TAL sites to which we can uh, make a decision to activate or not for any given launch. Uh, as I explained, we're going through that process 30 to 45 days prior to every launch right now. Um, we enjoy and prize the support of the Moroccan government in uh, continuing to uh, uh, invite us into their country and, and to use uh, that landing site. Uh, so the answer is yes, it is a, uh, it is a program available TAL landing site. And just to follow on that, I understand there was some sort of concern earlier this year. Could you, could you be, could you sort of describe what occurred uh, from a security sense that uh, 
raised a flag and when it was? No, I can. The reason is it, it's, it's, it's appropriate and prudent for us when it comes to the security details, which are part of the mix that go into every town site selection, uh, to not publicly discuss those details. Any further questions? All right. In that event, that will conclude our briefing.
not as smooth as my other flights. It's kind of oscillating a little bit. Let's do that big truss. Do the same. Yourself look good. If you look like over the APU supply, they put it in the window. Still cool mode, I guess, really. It's not cool. Check out the over the mirror now. Yep. Yep. I can see the moon. Got it. Got it. Got it. And go to Houston. Talk to APL. Talk to APL. Three minutes from me go.
the search is set up. Okay, I need a checklist. Okay, I'm up to uh, Antoine, go to Port Failures. That's one required bombs into the oxygen. Okay, let me check this. Yep, here we go. Two switches. Yep. I see both two valves closed. Okay, hydraulics next for over temp possible. And here we go. Go to post bombs one, Jim. Oh, uh, yeah. I see it's on 3 2. Very good cooling, all three. All right, show good cooling also. Post comes one. Yeah, I'm on post comes one, page three, two. Oh, okay. He's put in there three dash two, right? Let's read line by line, Wax. Okay. Then we're Houston, we're copying and we're with you. Okay, 1223 should be the end of the stop here, Papa. I agree. Okay, uh, management not required. You already gave him the time. Look at the tide. Number one, the hottest oil in. Not too bad, but the cooling is working. This is. Those get your attention, don't they? Water is your eyes, doesn't it? They're sawing us in. Okay, well, we. I wanted to uh, thank, of course, the SN team for doing such a great job on, on our ascent. It was pretty spectacular. I will uh, tell you a few words about ascent. Um, it was pretty amazing seeing. I, I hadn't remembered on a night launch, you can see the forward RCS jets firing just before the rockets separate, uh, before staging. And so that was pretty interesting. And then, of course, a very bright flash as the, as the rockets separate. After the roll, the heads up. It turned out we were pointed right towards the moon. We could see peripherally out of our vision at the front window, uh, which was pretty amazing, giving us a real sense that we were headed towards space as we were headed straight towards the moon. Uh, the power, of course, on ascent for the full eight minutes is just tremendous, and uh, I'm always surprised that we're not halfway to the moon by the time we finally have to go. Uh, second stage usually is, is pretty uh, smooth. This time, uh, the first time I've ever experienced some oscillation going uphill. I've heard it before with some payloads, uh, probably due to our, our 28,000-pound P1 truss in the payload bay. Nothing out of the ordinary, just uh, some oscillation going uphill. It wasn't as smooth as I remember. Of course, those engines sure worked great. Uh, we were very happy that everything worked on ascent. It was a, a great thrill, of course, and we would like to... Uh, again, thank everybody that helped us on the asset, all the folks, the contractors and uh, program managers and folks all around the country that helped us get ready for this flight and launch into orbit. <laughs>